shows you want to see continuing, yes. Okay, Will Sherman, you run a nightclub in Leeds. Is it doing well? Are there lots of young people coming in, spending yeah. lots of money? There certainly are, yes. Not just at weekends, now, it's midweek as well. We opened uh, a fortnight ago. And I find it's not just Saturday nights and Friday nights business that's doing well, it's also Tuesday, Wednesday and Thursday. So how do you think all that compares with, say, a year ago or five years ago? In well, I've lived in Leeds for seven years now. I've seen a real difference in the seven years. The attitude of the people at night time, the 24-hour city thing that the council have introduced is fantastic. Where it's now it... the clubbing capital of the country, I think. Where does all the money come from, do you think? Well, it's not just Leeds, it's the whole of the north of England, from as far as Manchester, Newcastle, Nottingham, the Midlands, I think, all over. So what do you think the Chancellor is going to do that's either going to help or hinder you? Well, I suppose I'm going to lose in the swings so I'm just getting on around about it, so just wait and see, really. So, Gary Marsh, what do you think Leeds is looking for from the budget? I think what we want is a very much a steady as she, go, as she goes budget. We're seeing the housing market picking up steadily now. We don't want anything to damage that recovery. We don't, certainly don't want to see any rise in interest rates as a, as a consequence of the budget. We want the chance to just keep the recovery in the economy going, let that, let that feed through to people's pockets and let the recovery in the housing market continue. So, Leeds looking good, could do a little bit better. David. Robin Oakley, do you think that uh, it's true that voters don't take much from these budgets and decide to change their vote on the basis of, say, a big tax-cutting budget? Well, it's certainly true that the biggest impact that any budget has ever had uh, post-war in terms of boosting a party's standing in the opinion polls is about six points. The average is only about one to three points uh, on a good and popular budget. And of course, with a government that's standing 15 to 18 points behind in the opinion polls, even a really good budget that goes down well with the public isn't going to do that much in terms of turning around their economic fortunes. And when you look at chancellors themselves, I mean, Dennis Healy, before the last budget he produced, before the 1979 election, 78% of the public thought he was doing a good job, only about 27% thought he was doing a bad job. But Labour lost the election. Geoffrey Howe in 82, 45% thought he was doing a good job, 45 a bad job, and they came back and won by 140 seats. Well, the Chancellor is in number 11 at the moment, and will soon be coming down the stairs there past the cartoons of other Chancellors, um, preceded by an assistant. Okay. Um, and, uh, <laughs> well, in a moment or so, we shall see him come down there. Um, these leaks that uh, we've had today, have they disconcerted the Chancellor, do you think? I mean, it must be pretty devastating to have to go to the House. The previous one, Hugh Dalton, there's Gillian on the right and the Chancellor and his staff behind. They, it's not much cop to stand up in the House of Commons. Everyone knows what you're going to say. Well, it detracts somewhat from the impact, but once he stands up, people will be concentrating that, on that and not on the uh, impression created by the leaks. The uh, Chancellor's fourth budget and 56 years old, brought up in Nottingham, in a mining village, and a successful barrister before he went to the House of Commons. He gave a very robust performance yesterday. Bridget Roswell, when you sit with him in the Treasury and give him your advice, does he, do, you, do you find him a good listener? Does he take notes? Oh, I think so, yes. He certainly listens carefully, as a, as a good lawyer should. And I think he also, he gives as good as he gets, if you like. He's certainly prepared to, uh, to stir up the panel, to, uh, to probe more deeply the views that we've got. It's a very stimulating experience, meeting him. You think he's a listener, though? I mean, that he takes advice? I think he, he takes, well, I think, yes, he listens to advice, but I think he makes his own decisions. Mm. He doesn't strike me as being anybody's poodle. Rather a jolly party on the steps of number 11, compared with the formal scenes from the past, the people waving Gladstone's budget bag and he gets into his car and goes down towards the House of Commons and his character of course is crucial to this budget every Chancellor has a different character and perhaps a different gut feeling about what the economy needs and what the voters are going to accept not just a matter of uh, working out the figures computers could do it if it was that it's a matter of judging the mood uh, of the of the of the public and of the economy and of business as well so what kind of Chancellor is Kenneth Clark. Nick Robinson reports. Little pert nose, little cheeky chappy type of mouth and uh, nice chin with a little cleft in it. Kenneth Clark is often portrayed as having been fattened for the kill, but even after Euro crises and budget leaks, Peter Brooks of the Times says that the essence of the Chancellor is that he never shows the pressure. You can't show him looking upset or make his eyebrows look as though they're going up in worry or, 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 um, or fear because simply uh, he, he doesn't display it. 
a keen collector of cartoons, Kenneth Clark's easygoing manner belies an acute awareness of his own image and of his role in shaping events. Um, he bought a spectator cover. Um, he tends to buy or be interested in the ones that uh, are possibly a little less critical or show him in a reasonable light um, as compared to the other people you're depicting. Clark may be relaxed, but his colleagues often aren't, fearing that what's good for him may turn out to be rather less good for them. They want big cuts in tax. He may not. Tories fear he'll do a Jenkins. Roy Jenkins' cautious pre-election budget is often blamed for losing Labour the 1970 general election, even though it later won him praise for doing the right thing for the economy. Well, I think uh, Ken now is a very senior politician, and I think he perhaps will be looking at his uh, position in history. Some people say that when they talk of history, that rather like Roy Jenkins, he might put that before any electoral consideration. Um, well, I think he might, on the one hand, but knowing his character, he's also uh, a very tough uh, operator who likes to win. And uh, I think he would very much like the, uh, the government to win the next election. And therefore, I think he might be torn. So I think we'll probably see a compromise between the winner in him and the uh, dispassionate Jenkins. The Chancellor rejects that. Another cartoon in the Clark collection reveals what he says drives him the need to banish the spectre of a return to the boom and bust of the 80s. With voters still bruised by the longest recession since the war, he's fond of saying, good economics is good politics. Ken Clark knows his political history, a history captured by these private eye cartoons on display at the National Portrait Gallery. The Chancellor knows that more than any decision he takes on tax and spend, it's his attitude to Europe that will determine his place in the history books, an issue that's dominated all the premierships on display at this exhibition, not least that of his first political boss, Ted Heath. Clark has told friends that, like Heath, he won't give up the fight on Europe. Perhaps that's why he bought this cartoon. Yesterday, he showed his determination that Britain should be ready to join the Euro. Today, he'll want to use the budget to bring down Britain's debt. He believes very firmly that, that, that Britain must lock permanently into the European Union, and I think that he thinks we will and should join at some stage the um, single European currency. But I think the key to him too is that he's, he's tough, obstinate even. Now, I would argue uh, that he's too obstinate about Europe. I think that's, uh, that's damaging um, uh, from my point of view. But it's good when he confronts problems with the British economy and he, he doesn't give up. Do your best, Chancellor. <laughs> Kenneth Clark's presence was felt at last week's Cartoon Art Trust Awards. Drawings of him came both first and second in the caricature section. Trog captures him perfectly, shot full of holes by the bad men of Toryville, but still unbowed. When asked about the Chancellor, one Tory whip quoted from the film Dirty Harry, he makes me nervous, he grimaced. It's that sheer unpredictability that could make this budget interesting despite the last-minute leak. It might well be his last budget eh, if we lost the election, which is, uh, is, has got to be accepted as a possibility, but in any case, he might go on to other things, to the Foreign Office, he's, he'll have been Chancellor a long time. And I think he will not want to go out in a splutter. I think he'll want to uh, make this budget go out with a bang. So I think you, you'll probably get some surprises. The newly anointed political cartoonist of the year is contemplating what budget image to use. Last year, Father Christmas handed out a very small gift. This year, the Chancellor's talked as if he'll play Scrooge. But before an election, that would seem, well, a little uncharacteristic. Nick Robinson reporting. So what are the voters going to make of this budget and of Kenneth Clark's attempt to woo them? For most voters, that really comes down to how they think it's going to affect them. Peter Snow's got a group of families with him in Dudley who are going to let us in on their own private budgets. Peter. <laughs> yes, sir, uh, David, here we are in the Merry Hill Shopping Centre outside K. Clark and Company's shop, having a look at what's on the shelves there. Uh, and we'll be working out the family fortunes of six families that I have here with me. I'm going to introduce them to you one by one, and we'll have a quick chat with them before the budget, and then, of course, work out for them. Our computer will work out uh, what exactly is going to happen to them after the budget. So off we go, then, down Budget Town's Main Street to visit the first of our families. Big one, this. There we have uh, Fiona and Cliff Duncan with their four children and uh, 
uh, Cliff is unemployed. Now, Cliff, what are you hoping for from this budget? Uh, well, basically, I'm hoping to be better off. Um, really, I don't want to be any worse off. And really, I'm just hoping for a fair budget for everybody. The trouble is, I mean, when we say better off, he's, going to, he's almost certainly going to raise taxes on drink and tobacco and stuff, isn't he? I mean, then the car, the petrol and so on. How can you be better off if you don't pay any tax? Well, I, I won't be, really. I mean, if, if he does raise them, then I'll be a little bit worse off because I do drive and I, I do Fiona? drink. Well, I'd like him to help towards childcare, education and health care because th those are the most important things for all families. You'd like him to spend more rather than reduce direct taxation? Yes. OK, well, let's see what happens later on then when he, when he comes to make his speech up the street now to look at what happens to pensioners. And uh, we've got uh, John and Doris Bradley with us. They're earning £10,000 a year from their pension. Now then, Doris, what would you like from this budget? I'd like to see the VAT on domestic fuel reduced, if not abolished, but that's a bit of a pipe dream. I also hope he won't tax petrol too highly because it does have a knock-on effect over the whole of the economy. You say it's a pipe dream. Uh, John, uh, of course, it was the Tories who raised it to 8% uh, VAT on domestic fuel and Labour have promised to reduce it to 5%. Now, how much difference did it make to you if the Tories did that? Well, promises are like pie crusts, aren't they? <laughs> but you mean you I... don't believe the Labour Party? When it, when it comes into effect, yes. <laughs> But I, I feel that uh, the indirect taxation, VAT, is the uh, main thing that should be reduced. And if he's going to invest, invest in the National Health Service. OK, OK, John and Doris, on now, on now to the uh, couple who are on 12,000 a year. There they are with their uh, baby, 20-month-old baby, Brett and Sarah Baines. Brett, what would you like from the budget? Hopefully more investment in education and also in hospitals. Definitely like to see that. What about direct taxation? That's the likeliest thing is a drop in income tax. How's that going to suit you? Um, I'd like to see it, but I'd sooner pay probably a little bit more in, 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 di in direct taxes and probably bring down um, in di or exterior taxes down probably a little bit. Sarah? Um, yet again, I'd like to see more money pushed into education in the hospitals, the National Health Service. I'd also like to see a reduction in direct taxes, such as VAT, for example. So spend, spend, all, spend, better, better, spend all better services, don't want too much dropping in income tax. That's the message so far we have from our families here. Now let's go on to the average earnings couple. Here we have uh, Colin and Val Mitchell, £20,000 a year with their two children at university. Yes. Uh, Val. Yeah, I, I want um, a budget for the future, uh, one where they invest in education and jobs. But tax cuts, income tax cuts, what about that? Wouldn't that attract you? It wouldn't help me that much, no. Um, I, I want it put it into education. If there's some left over, I'll have some. Colin, if, if this Chancellor is to win this party, this government, the election, what's the one thing he's got to do for you? He's got to put people back to work. Because... Um, You're not doing too badly. You're down to, what, two million this year or so, and then below that next year? <laughs> if, you, if you believe those figures, yes. Uh, but I, I don't believe them personally. I, I think... Um, I, I've got two kids, as you, as you said, we're at university, and hopefully they'll get their degree this year. Now, it, ten years ago, if they'd have got a degree, they would have automatically gone into a job, but that's not the case anymore. OK, over the road quickly now to the £40,000 a year family, twice, twice as much as uh, the Mitchells, Peter and Sandra Morby on £40,000 a year. There's their daughter Ellie with them, she's 23. Peter. Well, I would like to see a balanced budget this time, or even a small surplus, <laughs> but um, as far as business is concerned, I, I don't want to see uh, diesel fuel taxes go up, because it would have a bad effect on me. OK, we'll hear from Sandra later, because I want to go straight on now, just to just quickly have a go before we join, the, we go to the House of Commons. And we have, uh, here we have our uh, better off couple still. They're on uh, £100,000 a year, Stan and Helen Thatcher. Now then, Stan, what do you want from this budget? Well, I'd like to see a larger than expected reduction in direct taxation. I'd like to see a larger increase in indirect taxation than expected. I would like to see a lot of help for small business people, but most of all, I'd like help in private medicine, tax concessions in private medicine, that not necessarily for the better off, but, but to help a national health service that is running very, very low at the moment. Helen, do you agree with Stan? You want to see a drop in direct... You're one of the few couples here who wants to see a really definite drop in direct taxation. In yes, tax. yes, that's what I'd like to see also. This would help us all, I think. Even the housewife at home would all feel better off if our <laughs> husband... Peter Morby, you, you pay a lot yeah, of uh, income tax. Wouldn't you like to see income tax come down? No, no I'm, I'm, uh, really, I've got a social conscience, and, and, and I, I, I do believe that 
there's certain things that a government needs to spend on. And um, okay. if it means paying a fair proportion, but well, I, okay. I don't want to see um, incentive gone out of right. taxation. We'll come back to all of you after the Chancellor's changes and see exactly how you're all affected. But in the meantime, David, back to you in London. Thanks very much, Peter. Well, it's interesting, apart from the man of the family on 100,000, nobody wanted direct tax cuts. Do they? No. So, yet the politicians are obsessed by them. Politicians will remain obsessed by them because before the last election, when people asked, were asked by opinion pollsters would they like to see more spending on public services in preference to tax cuts, they said yes, they would. Uh, but then they went into the election uh, booths and they voted the Tories back into office. And when the same people were questioned afterwards, they said, well, we did actually rather think that Labour would put our taxes up. So you think that this is all eyewash that we're hearing? Well, we'll see. Let's, uh, let's go down to the House of Commons now. It's just coming just after quarter past three, and in a moment, Michael Patillo is on his feet at the moment, but in a moment for Prime Minister's questions, and we join Carolyn Quinn. And those questions just about to begin, David. The first question. This morning I presided at a meeting of the Cabinet and had meetings with ministerial colleagues and others. In addition to my duties in this House, I shall be having further meetings later today. Mr Ray? Is the Prime Minister aware that the Government took in £7.2 billion pounds in tobacco duties. Is he also aware that the Health and Education Authority states that it's costing the health service £680 million pounds and 110,000 deaths annually? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know that the government is against litigation by the Department of Health, but would he further agree with me that there's further ban needed on advertising of tobacco? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think, as the Honourable Gentleman knows, we have indicated the dangers of tobacco in many advertising programmes, uh, in many advertising campaigns, and also, of course, on every packet of cigarettes. Uh, I think that is an appropriate way to indicate the dangers, together, of course, with the disincentive of the taxation on tobacco. Michael Grill. Uh, would, uh, would my right honourable friend, see if he can find time today to consider the cash flow crisis that's affecting so many lorry drivers? many of whom are very small firms or self-employed, which is due entirely to the failure of the French government to keep their highways clear. As a, as a practical measure, could my right honourable friend consider asking the, gov the banks to be patient with these firms and also you do everything he can to the French government to make sure that they act responsibly? Well, Madam Speaker, I am concerned about the consequences for British drivers and companies of this dispute which is, of course, in France and has nothing whatsoever to do with them or their customers. We have indicated to the French government that we would expect claims for compensation for loss of earnings or damage to be perishable stock to be met, and they, uh, I hope, will respond to that plea. My right honourable friend, the Secretary of State, has already written to his French opposite number, calling for an end to the dispute and making the point about necessary compensation. And I won't hesitate to raise the matter elsewhere if necessary. Jolie Blair. Yeah. Madam Speaker, given that the Prime Minister fought the last general election on the specific pledge that he would cut taxes every year, will he now at least apologise for the fact that whatever the Chancellor does today, after 22 Conservative tax rises, the average British family will pay more in tax at the next election than they did at the last and his promise was broken? Well, I think the uh, right honourable gentleman is confused. As he, as he will know, we now have the basic lowest rate of income tax for 50 years. And the fact is, under the government, that even before today's budget, the average family will be £700 better off this year, after tax and inflation, than at the last election. But if the right honourable gentleman is concerned about transparency in tax matters and tax promises, Perhaps he will publish his own tax plans, which his deputy leader says it would be stupid of him to do. Yeah. Madam Speaker, perhaps then he would answer an even simpler question, since he can't answer that one. Does he recall promising that he would not raise national insurance before the election and after the election raising it? Does he recall that, yes or no? The right honourable gentleman knows very well the changes knows very well the reductions that we have made in tax and whatever he may seek to do, he cannot, he cannot deny the fact that taxes are lower today than they have been in the past, that they are lower than they would be under any Labour government, 
and that if he were to begin to meet his spending pledges, pledges he makes at his party conference and then seeks to deny outside his party conference, that taxation in the United Kingdom would rise and rise and rise again were he ever to have any responsibility for the Exchequer. We can't answer the first two. Perhaps he'll answer this one. Does he recall going into the last election saying he would not put VAT on fuel and power and then putting it on fuel and power? Yes or no? If the Honourable Gentleman wants to discuss that, if he wants to discuss value-added tax, perhaps he can tell us why he can make promises on that, but he cannot tell us about the windfall tax, or the tartan tax, or the London tax, or the teenage tax, or his spending promises, or his taxation promises, or anything at all that is relevant to the management of this economy. Uh, Mr William Cash. Don't, 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 does my... Does my, does my right honourable friend recollect that yesterday, in the statement given by the Chancellor of the Exchequer, a most welcome statement, that he, he, said, he said with respect to one of the regulations that he would be most reluctant to contemplate using the veto. Bearing in mind that the Dublin summit will, of course, be a European Council meeting and not a meeting of the Council of Ministers, and that the scrutiny reserve will be applied to the ECOFID meeting, does my right honourable friend agree with the, my right honourable friend, the Chancellor of the Exchequer, that he would be reluctant, that is, himself, to the question of vetoing one of those regulations? <laughs> what? If my honourable friend, if my honourable friend would care to look, he presumably is referring to recital 13. I assume that is what he is referring to. If he'd cared to look at what my right honourable friend said yesterday, he made it clear that he would he would be reiterating to the meeting of finance ministers that there's no legal basis upon which countries not participating in the single currency can have sanctions imposed upon them. And in reply to my right honourable friend, the member for Wokingham. My right honourable friend, the Chancellor, made it clear that he'd be seeking the best possible language to ensure that that understanding is copper-bottomed. Mr Ian Pearson. Number two, Madam Speaker. I refer the honourable gentleman to the reply I gave some moments ago. Pearson. Will the Prime Minister confirm that cutting VAT on domestic fuel and power will help every household in Dudley and nationally, while scrapping inheritance and capital gains tax will benefit at most 3% of the population. Why does he persist in supporting policies that favour the few instead of the many? The policies uh, we have followed have produced the best economic circumstances this country has seen for generations. And that is there to help the many, to encourage investment, to encourage domestic investment, to encourage inward investment, to encourage the creation of jobs, to encourage growth, all of which is happening in this country in a way the honourable gentleman cannot point to in any other European country. Yeah. Michael Colvin. Number three, Madam Speaker. I refer my honourable friend to the reply I gave some moments ago. Colvin. Has my right honourable friend seen the International Labour Organisation report which is published today, which shows that in every country abroad unemployment is rising, whilst in Britain, exceptionally, it is falling? Isn't that further evidence of the merits of the government's economic policy, which has made Britain the success that it is? And wasn't the right honourable and noble lady, the Baroness Thatcher, quite right last week in a speech to say, don't let Labour ruin it. Yeah. Uh, Madam Speaker, when the, uh, when the news is improving and unemployment is falling and the economy is growing as, as it is at the moment, there is uh, very little for the opposition to say. They hate good news because they know it's extremely bad news for them. Yeah because they didn't help bring about the strongest economy of any Western European country, which is what we've got. They didn't help get more people in work, which is what we've done with the labour reforms that we produced. They didn't help make this the number one country for inward investment anywhere in Western Europe. 
and they didn't help create the lowest basic rate of tax for 50 years. So my honourable friend is right, as was my right honourable and noble friend last week. Labour are still not fit to govern, and I doubt they will be in a position to do so. Just to let you know, the Chancellor has just made his way into the chamber. Madam Speaker. I refer the honourable gentleman to the reply I gave some moments ago. In view of the Prime Minister's uh, completely unsatisfactory response earlier to my right honourable friend, yeah, yeah. can I ask him again, why did he promise tax cuts before the last election and why has he subsequently broken that promise? Yeah. Yeah. The honourable gentleman may recall... The honourable gentleman may recall the urgings of his front bench with, and our determination also to protect people during the recession. Yeah, yeah. I make no apology for the fact that we sought to protect people during the recession. I make no apology for the fact that by doing so we have now delivered the best economic circumstances the honourable gentleman can ever remember. And if he wants transparency in tax matters, I challenge him again. Publish his own tax plans that the right honourable gentleman says it would be stupid to let the public hear about. Yeah. Mr Couchman. Further to my honourable friend for Surrey North West's question about the lorry driver's strike in France, has my right honourable friend perhaps contacted the European Commissioner for Traffic? If he has, did he find him conscious of the plight of British drivers or was the European Commissioner too busy studying leaked documents from the Treasury? Well, I, uh, I have not uh, myself contacted the European Commissioner, but I understand that he has, made, he has made representations to the French expressing concern about the welfare of drivers. The Commissioner referred to Neil Kinnock. This is a specific question about the operation of the job seekers allowance. To do so. Mr Corbett, the Prime Minister really ought to be ashamed of himself that he isn't prepared to go along to a job centre to discuss the introduction of the job seekers allowance because it is having a very serious effect on a very large number of people, particularly because of the parallel introduction of the incapacity benefit under which many disabled people who have to face an all work test lose out on benefits altogether, then try to get um, unemployment benefit through the, through the job seekers allowance. And I would ask the Prime Minister, when he visits a job centre, to look at this and find out what he intends to do for the 220,000 people, disabled people, who next year will be applying under the job seekers allowance for unemployment benefits and will probably lose it and end up destitute as a result of it. Yeah. Well, the honourable gentleman is talking nonsense and he knows, I think, that he is uh, talking nonsense. The purpose of the job seekers allowance, as he should know, is to help people plan the most effective route back into work. It creates a better framework of advice and support for the job seeker. It ensures that claimants better understand that benefit is dependent upon the activities they take to look to, for work, and I believe that principle is well understood and well supported across the country. And it's also, of course, underpinned by the Job Seekers Agreement, which sets out what each job seeker agrees in order to find work. I think this is infinitely preferable to the old system of unemployment benefit and income support, which was both confusing and in many ways unfair. Patrick Thomas. Number six, Madam Speaker. I refer my honourable friend to the reply I gave some moments ago. Johnson. Madam Speaker, is my right honourable friend aware of the exhibition to be held in the upper waiting hall here in the House of Commons next week to highlight the tremendous achievements of our engineering and manufacturing industry in this country? Yeah, yeah. Does he agree that engineering offers an attractive prospect, a career prospect for our young people? And will he pay tribute today to those who are working to promote the achievements of the engineering industry through the Year of Engineering <coughs> Success campaign coming up next year. Yeah. Uh, well, I'm grateful to hear about the exhibition that my honourable friend mentions. I certainly agree with his uh, sentiments, and indeed that was a key aspect of the competitiveness of white paper a short while ago, and precisely why we launched Action for Engineering to increase engineering's contribution to the national economy. There are now about 150,000 more people employed in manufacturing than three years ago. That reverses a long-term trend. It's very welcome. And in addition to that, there are some 40 to 50,000 people, I think, on modern apprenticeship schemes. 
So I agree entirely with the views of my honourable friend, a very important part of the British economy. Reverend Martin Smith. Seven, Madam Speaker. I refer the honourable gentleman to the reply I gave some moments ago. Reverend Martin Smith. Has the Prime Minister noticed a change in emphasis between the hard man, soft man of the IRA, Sinn Féin? Uh, Martin McGuinness is now promising to move heaven and earth. I know he's tried to move earth in the past. I don't believe he's any influence in heaven. But on the other hand, <laughs> Mitchell McLaughlin is now threatening if the Prime Minister does not come up to the terms that there will be lethal consequences. Will the Prime Minister speak on behalf of the nation that we're not prepared to bow to the threats of terrorists? Yeah. Well, as the, as the Honourable Gentleman knows, and as the House wholly accepts, IRA terrorism is utterly unacceptable for any purpose, at any time, in any place. And it's also completely counterproductive if uh, there is any suggestion that uh, terrorism will bring Sinn Féin to the negotiating table. It emphatically will not bring them to the negotiating table. If I may quote what the Taoiseach said recently, with which I entirely agree, if Republicans are committed to peace as they say they are, let them call a ceasefire now and make it a credible ceasefire. Yeah. That Ken Clark's moment now. Yeah. Friends of the Chancellor was saying earlier in the lobby that he's in a bullion mood, despite everything over the past two days. Now, we understand that he's going to be drinking Glen Farkless malt whiskey during the speech. No doubt take a few sips over the next hour or so. Call the Chancellor of the Exchequer. It may be for the convenience of honourable members if I remind them that at the end of the Chancellor's speech, copies of the budget resolutions will be available to honourable members in the vote office. <laughs> Mr Chancellor of the Exchequer. <laughs> well, Mr Deputy Speaker, uh, well, contrary to popular belief, I do always look at the mirror in the morning and uh, <laughs> think on this occasion. I am uh, reasonably well prepared for this occasion. I am about to deliver uh, the real budget statement. <laughs> and I think this is positively my last appearance in the House in a speaking capacity in the course of this week, or so at the moment I expect it to be. But... <laughs> <laughs> Mr Deputy Speaker, the, the British economy is today prosperous and successful. And, uh, And this budget has got to make it even more prosperous and an even bigger success over the coming years. And uh, when I presented my first budget in 1993, it was against a very different economic background from today. Although the recovery had begun then, consumer confidence hadn't yet returned, growth wasn't yet firmly established, further firm action was needed on the public finances, and our critics in 1993 were peddling doom and gloom about the British economy. Recovery is now in its fifth year. Consumer conference, confidence has returned and we're achieving something unprecedented for a generation in this country. Growth with low inflation and without a widening trade gap. But one thing hasn't changed in 1996. Our critics are still peddling doom and gloom. In fact, with all, all their predictions of impending disaster, it's obvious that there's probably more than one Cassandra lurking in the Labour Party. Reference to a Labour critic. In my first two budgets, I curbed the growth of uh, public spending and I took firm decisions on tax, which have brought borrowing down by almost half since 1993. Last year, in my third budget, I was able to return to cutting tax while spending more on the public services, which people I know care about most, health, schools and the police, and keeping borrowing on a firm downward path. This year, I'm presenting a budget which builds on the last three. This budget reduces public spending plans further while providing more money for priority services. It makes responsible progress on our tax-cutting agenda while getting borrowing down faster. This isn't a reckless budget on either tax or spending. The run up to Christmas, I'm not going to play Santa Claus, but this year I don't have to play Scrooge either. Yeah. But, but I, I have. <laughs> I, I have 
I have one overriding aim, which is the lasting health of the British economy. Oh, yes. Uh, and the lasting health of the British economy might win elections. That is true. But my first aim is the lasting health of the British economy. And we're securing that by creating the best conditions for British businesses and British men and women to earn a living. All my budgets and all my policies have been designed to set this country on course to be the strongest industrial economy in Western Europe in years to come. The British economy, Mr Deputy Speaker, is in its fifth successive year of steady, healthy economic growth, with falling unemployment and low inflation. These are the best circumstances we face for a generation. It's the only sensible background to debate in this House. It's a Rolls-Royce recovery, and it's built to last. Yeah. Yeah. The IMF and the OECD confidently expect the United Kingdom to be the fastest growing major European economy again next year. And by next year, we'll have grown faster than either France or Germany for five years in succession for the first time in half a century. And this time, unlike so many previous recoveries that many of us remember, healthy growth has been accompanied by the best inflation performance for nearly 50 years and restrained growth of earnings has been good news for jobs. The British labour market has become our flexible friend. Employment, employment began to rise sooner and unemployment began to fall sooner than in the previous recovery. Growth creates jobs quicker so long as we retain a flexible labour market. The OECD have praised us for having one of the least regulated labour markets in the industrialised world. High social overheads, minimum wages and unnecessary legislation don't protect workers. They actually cost jobs. Yeah. Unemployment is still rising in France and unemployment is still rising in Germany. It's fallen sharply here to its lowest level for over five and a half years. And in the bad old days, recoveries were derailed by balance of payments crises. In this recovery, the current account has actually improved despite the slowdown in our main European markets. In fact, we now have a current account broadly in balance, which is our best overall trading performance for nearly 10 years. So, Mr Deputy Speaker, I want to ask the British people in the years ahead, do we seriously want to be prosperous in this country? I think we do. That's why I'm setting out an economic policy aimed at the next five years, not just the next five months. I'm setting out an economic policy that will go on delivering our enviable combination of rising prosperity, low inflation and more jobs. That's my purpose in this budget. This budget secures a prosperous future for all sections of our people and their families. And the last thing the British economy needs now is a change of direction. We need at least another five years of this government's continuous vigilance on inflation. We need more of this government's determination to get government borrowing down. We need another five years of this government's commitment to raise the wealth-creating potential of the British economy by improving incentives, reducing the role of the state and creating a climate for enterprise. So let me begin by turning to my forecast for growth. Mr Deputy Speaker, I expect the British economy to grow by 2.5% this year and 3.5% next year, and there are a few serious commentators who would disagree with me. I hear mutterings from the Shadow C C Chancellor. There are a few serious commentators who would disagree with me. By keeping, by keeping a close eye on the prospects for inflation up to two years out and by taking sensible early action if and when necessary, I intend to ensure that healthy growth continues without inflationary pressures emerging. That's what I have always promised. No return to boom and bust. I expect consumers' expenditure to continue to be the main engine of growth next year. The real value of take-home pay is growing strongly the housing market recovery is now firmly established, and I hope, I hope that negative equity can soon be consigned to the economic history books. 
people are feeling the improvement in their own family finances. And consumer confidence is at its highest levels for over eight years. So I expect consumer spending to grow by 3% in 1996 as a whole, but it's been strengthening throughout this year. So I expect stronger growth to continue with consumers expenditure rising by over 4% next year. But this recovery isn't just about a more confident consumer. Businesses are optimistic too. The climate for business is excellent. Strong demand at home and a recovery in our key export markets present British industry and commerce with tremendous opportunities. Interest rates and tax rates remain low and profitability is high. And the result has been business investment growth of 6% so far this year. I expect business investment to continue to grow strongly by almost 10% next year. And these excellent conditions for business aren't, aren't lost on overseas companies looking to invest for the future inside the European market. Let us never forget the most valuable practical endorsement that we get for our sound economic policies. The United Kingdom remains the number one destination for inward investment into the European Union. And keeping our enterprise economy on course at the heart of Europe will keep us in pole position. Exports have grown, Mr Deputy Speaker, by almost 20% over the last two years. And that's a very impressive performance in the face of weak demand in our key European markets. The achievement is down to our exporters, to our strong, cost-conscious British exporting companies. But they'll benefit further next year as the tentative recovery on the continent becomes more established. I expect export volumes to rise by over 7% this year and 6% next year. The current account has been close to balance during the last two and a half years thanks to strong growth in exports and income from our investments overseas. I expect the current account to remain broadly in balance this year and next. As I said earlier, our thriving economy, I'm glad to say, is creating jobs. Employment in the United Kingdom has risen by over three quarters of a million real jobs since the recovery began. Unemployment has fallen by almost a million from its peak and it will soon drop through the two million mark. But that's still too high. We're about to go below two million. It's still too high. I want it to go on falling and I expect it to go on falling. I do hope that the uh, Shadow Chancellor is going to get up and say in the course of this debate that he forecasts that unemployment will now rise month after month. That seemed to help our performance in the labour market in this country <laughs> the last time that he said it. We're on course to get underlying inflation down to our target of 2.5% or less and to keep it there. In October, underlying inflation rose uh, to just over 3%. It shouldn't have surprised anybody who looked at last year's statistics. It's a temporary and inevitably reflection of the quite exceptional actual falls in the price level 12 months before. But let me give the House my concrete reasons for being so confident about low inflation. Apart from oil prices, which have risen sharply, commodity prices are steady and they're not putting any upward pressure on inflation. Earnings growth in this country remains sensible and modest. Producer price inflation, which is a very good indication of what's in the pipeline for the retail price inflation, is at its lowest levels in this country since the 1960s. And producer input prices are actually lower than they were a year ago. So any risk to this recovery from inflationary pressures re-emerging remains a good way off. But as I've demonstrated, Mr Deputy Speaker, again and again, when I see any risks, I will act. And I will continue to stay ahead of the game on monetary policy. Eddie will keep me steady, and I intend to continue to be canny. Because I expect underlying inflation to meet our target of 2.5% or less. And I'll ensure that we go on meeting that target for the foreseeable future. We made good progress in reducing public sector borrowing, but that's not been as fast as I expected. This budget, therefore, targets public sector borrowing again. The general public uh, may ask, why do I concentrate on public sector borrowing in the way that I do? 
Well, one reason why... Wait, somebody said it's because that I Tory. That is a very good reason for concentrating on public sector <laughs> borrowing, as I do. But one reason why I continue to concentrate so heavily on public borrowing is setting, setting policy is because money spent paying the interest on our debt is, in my opinion, money that I prefer to spend on public services and the reduction of taxation. We are making good progress on bringing down borrowing, but lower than expected tax revenues mean that it hasn't fallen as fast as I expected in the last budget. It's not bad news for everyone. People are no doubt quite glad not to be paying as much tax as I expected. But as I am the Chancellor, I strongly prefer to keep any tax cuts under my own control. <laughs> the causes of these shortfalls in our forecasts of tax revenue, that primarily on value-added tax but also on direct taxes, can't wholly be explained by any experts inside or outside the revenue departments. But there does seem to be an increasing tendency to exploit loopholes and use special reliefs in an artificial way to reduce tax bills. Those sort of tax cuts are unacceptable. On that, I seem to have agreement. And if they're not tackled every year in the budget, they mean that a few people pay less tax, but the rest must pay more. In this budget, I propose quite a number of measures to stem tax leakage, to protect the ordinary taxpayer, and make sure that we do get the right tax from the right people. When I do reduce tax, I want to do so in a way that's fair for all businesses and fair for all hard-working British men and women. Government borrowing has been steadily coming down for three years, and this budget will ensure that government borrowing keeps coming down. I expect the public sector borrowing requirement to be £26.5 billion this year, and that will mean it's halved as a share of GDP over the past three years. I expect it to come down to £19 billion next year and to be broadly in balance by 1999 to 2000. That pattern of declining borrowing is very much better than the one I had to put in my summer economic forecast last July. Since I produced the summer forecast which we debated in this House last summer, I've reduced my expectations by £4 billion in my forecast for next year. And a large part of that improvement is the result of the measures that I am taking in this budget. This budget tightens fiscal policy. And the reason that I am tightening fiscal policy now is in order to reduce the risk of having to tighten monetary policy excessively as I set policy to hit my inflation target. My decisions are always taken solely in British interest to benefit the British economy. But my decisions in this budget also mean that, uh, by happy coincidence, we will meet the Maastricht debt and deficit criteria in 1997, and we'll do even better than that in the medium term. No, it's a... It's a... <laughs> I, don't need a I don't need assistance from nationalists. It is a happy coincidence for everyone, because those criteria make sound economic sense, as we all agree, with or without a single currency. And our option whether to join or stay out of a single currency based on British national interest remains a genuine choice. We will qualify, but we will choose in the next Parliament when the time comes. This government is the champion of sound public finances, of limited government, and of low taxation. And our combination of low taxation, low public spending and low debt is the best in Europe. And we intend to stay in that enviable position, and we can only do this if we continue to bear down on public spending. Looking at public spending in the 1980s across the rest of Europe, the modern state remorselessly took an ever greater share of almost every nation's wealth on the continent. We in Britain held the line. The proportion of GDP going into government spending in the United Kingdom is now 8% lower than the average in the rest of the European Union. If our spending had risen under Conservative government to continental levels, we would now have to raise nearly £2,300 a year more in tax from every British household. Now, I've set a target 
of 40% or below for the share of national income that should go on public spending. Making progress towards that desirable target means tough decisions on public spending every year. This year we've had to cope with the costs of BSE. This year we've had to cope with the larger than expected increase in the costs of Social Security as more and more elderly and disabled people receive benefits to which they are entitled. But against this background, we had to keep the rest of public spending within the tightest possible limits in order for us to spend more on the public services that people really care about, education, combating crime, and on our national health service. This country has been served well by my chief, uh, my honourable friend, the Chief Secretary, who has successfully tackled this problem. Despite all the difficulties, in a very difficult round, we've been able to reduce public spending plans over the next three years by a further £7 billion in this budget. Public spending next year will be over £24 billion lower than was projected for that year when I became Chancellor, and that's a reduction of 7%. And we've been able to reduce spending plans because we have lower inflation, falling unemployment, a continuing campaign for efficiency in the public sector, and sensible policy priorities and a government capable of taking decisions about those priorities. And on top of that, the government's relentless drive against fraud and the abuse of tax and benefits will be stepped up another gear. Next year, we are going to meet our target of 40% for the share of national income that goes on public spending. In last year's budget, I said I would make 40% in 1997 to 1998, and this year's budget secures that important goal. Yeah. And so long as we keep, as the next Conservative government will keep the growth in public spending down below the growth in the economy, we will go below that. Now, education is the key to the future of any prosperous and civilised society. Education helps to determine how well the economy performs in the long run as well. It also helps to determine the sort of citizens that we have and the sort of society that we have. This government is committed to raising standards in education. As a result of last year's budget, £878 million extra was provided for schools this year. We are giving schools priority again in this budget. Planned expenditure on schools will rise by another £830 million pounds next year. A large proportion of this money, £633 million, pounds, which is an increase of 3.6%, will be challenged through the local authorities. Uh, I see the Honourable Gentleman for Sheffield Brightside shaking his head. Perhaps it didn't reach his schools. I'm not as familiar with Sheffield as he, he is. I mean, David Blunkett. By last year's experience, Local authorities are reluctant to pass on the increases in their SSA to their schools. Oh, yes. Many prefer to spend the money on other areas of their choosing. Well, it's no good local authorities campaigning for more spending on education in the autumn and then spending their money on other things in the spring. Parents will want to make sure that their local authorities spend money on the things they want for their children good teachers and better equipped schools, and I hope the Honourable Member for Sheffield Brightside makes the same efforts to ensure that Sheffield passes it on if they didn't last year. A good school has a value far and beyond its buildings, but the quality of school buildings at which our children are taught is still very important. We have a long way to go uh, to get up from the post-war area to the standards we require. We will be providing an extra £50 million on top of the previously planned provision for more capital investment to improve the fabric of our schools. By setting high standards for schools and increasing choice for parents, this government is delivering better trained and better qualified young people. Almost one in three young people now go on to university compared with one in eight in 1979. And our universities and colleges maintain some of the highest standards in the world despite the pressure on their unit costs that this unprecedented explosion of opportunity for our young people has produced. But I recognise this pressure, I have heard about these pressures, and I also realise that our universities and colleges make an important contribution to the future of the British economy. 
My budget therefore includes £280 million to boost further and higher education over the next two years. This includes an extra £20 million next year for science equipment because we want to ensure that the British science research base remains the best in the world, which it certainly is at the present time. As the Secretary of State, uh, as my right honourable friend, the Secretary of State for Education and Employment, announced in September, the Government's planning a substantial sale of student loans debt. It makes no sense for the Government to keep a huge portfolio of loans on its books when the private sector could manage it more effectively and the private sector is better placed to cope with the risk. I emphasise that the sale will have no effect on the terms upon which students can get loans. The substantial reduction in the figures for education that members will find published in the new spending plans opposite the line is actually more than accounted for by the sale of this debt. As I've just described, we will actually spend more on the things that really matter, educating our children and educating our young people. This government believes that effective law and order is an essential part of making Britain a nation at ease with itself. A good quality police service and an effective system of criminal justice are very high on this list of this government's priorities. Uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, when it comes to spending on law and order, this government's got a record as long as your arm. Spending, spending more money on a much better police service, spending more money on a much better criminal justice system, I plead guilty as charged if that is the charge against my government, uh, Madam Deputy Mr Deputy Speaker. Spending on law and order has already doubled in real terms since 1979. Provision for combating crime. Police and prisons will now rise by another £450 million next year. Our plans provide for 2,000 more police constables by the end of next year, and we're well on course to meet the Prime Minister's pledge for 5,000 more constables. Our British National Health Service, with treatment free at the point of delivery, is the envy of the world. I think it's the best system of health care that I've ever encountered. In every modern civilised society, the demand for better health care for new techniques to save lives and improve our quality of life grows constantly and remorselessly. This government completely understands that. That's why we have increased spending by some 75% in real terms since 1979. And that's why the Prime Minister has pledged on our behalf more resources for the National Health Service in real terms every year throughout the next Parliament, a pledge to which, to my constant mystification, the Honourable Gentleman, Right Honourable Gentleman, has not yet brought himself to match. But we're actually spending no money, and we're spending that money better as well, and that matters. We have reformed the National Health Service, so it's much better managed and much more efficient. And it's no good opposing these improvements, because when waste is reduced, more can be directed to higher quality patient care. And that means that patients get more treatment and care out of every extra pound that we are spending. Now for next year, we will increase current spending on patient services in the National Health Service by 1.6 billion pounds, or 2.9% in real terms. The real increase in current spending for hospitals next year, over and above inflation, will be 3%. And on top of this, private finance initiative investment will play an increasingly important role in providing new health care facilities. The PFI contract for the Norfolk and Norwich Hospital Scheme, worth close to £200 million, was signed yesterday, and others will follow. <laughs> it is. <laughs> I'm grateful to my right honourable friend, the Secretary of State, for health aside tomorrow, but I don't think he had the budget in mind. There are many in the pipeline. He had the people of Norfolk and Norwich in mind and the efficiency and the investment in our national health service. 
um, PFI investment in the NHS will reach some £900 million over the next three years on top of the increased public spending I am announcing. And I think the party opposite have at last belatedly, I think, become converted to that source of investment in our great national health service. The NHS will continue to grow and it will continue to improve. We are totally committed to the National Health Service as a public service providing high quality, up-to-date treatment free at the point of delivery. But by our, de our decisions on public spending, we as a government prove that the National Health Service remains at the top of this government's priorities. The National Health Service has been safe in our hands, it is safe in our hands, and it will always be safe in our hands. This year's spending realm was as tight as any I can remember. I keep describing it as eye-wateringly tight. But we've never lost sight of our objective, which is to sustain and improve the key public services that the British public care about. Education, combating crime and our national health service. In part, we've achieved that by increasing efficiency within the priority services. But inevitably, we've also had to find savings in other programmes. Find out in a minute. Falling, <laughs> Falling unemployment and lower inflation has helped to reduce social security and employment programs. We're also continuing to transfer activities to the private sector where this is more efficient as it is for student loans. We refocused the housing program to encourage the use of private finance and the transfer of the local authority housing stock to the private sector. We're stepping up our programmes against fraud. We're continuing our remorseless squeeze on the costs of bureaucracy itself. And we've looked in every department for ways of achieving our objectives more economically. With efficiency savings, most departments will be able to deliver their programmes next year, but with less public money in real terms. People pay their taxes in order to get good quality public services, not to accumulate state-owned buildings. And uh, this simple truth has led to the development uh, of the private finance initiative, which I've just referred to in the context of health. PFI does help to square the circle of sound public finances and the growing demand for better and more modern public services by tapping the expertise and the resources of the private sector. A year ago, we had agreed one and a half billion pounds worth of deals. Now we've agreed seven billion pounds, and we're on course to deliver double that by March 1999. And time and again, the taxpayers getting better value for money across a whole area of activities, road schemes, prisons, information technology projects, and so on. And reforms to local government rules are bringing the PFI into new areas, notably schools. If I may take one example where we are, London. London is currently experiencing a transport investment boom under the PFI. The Channel Tunnel Rail Link, Thames Link 2000, the Docklands Light Railway Extension, and the A40 and the A13 improvements. That's in addition to conventional public and private capital spending on the Jubilee Line Extension, the Heathrow Express, and the new A12 M11 Hackney Link. Investment in London's transport. London transport is now running at 50% in real terms above the average for the 1980s. London will soon become one of the biggest construction sites in the country. As a defiantly provincial Nottingham man, I can only say I hope London's an even nicer place when it's finished. But adding traditional capital spending to PFI investment, publicly sponsored capital spending in the United Kingdom in the next three years will be substantially higher in real terms than it was in the 1980s. Now, one third of all public spending goes on social security. Our social security system is there to provide an income when people can't earn because of sickness, disability, unemployment, caring for relatives, or old age. People on the left and the right of politics continue to search for a radically different and better way of meeting these needs in our wealthy nation. Now, I've studied many of their proposals, studied them closely. So far, I'm afraid, nobody's yet come up with anything remotely sensible or practicable. And until they do come up with a radical alternative, if they ever do, our welfare safety net must remain if affordable. 
and must not allow the welfare state to damage the incentives of individuals or businesses in the private sector because it's the wealth-creating enterprise economy that sustains the whole of our social security system. In the post-war period, social security has grown in real terms by around 5% each year. In recent budgets, we've taken action to bring that growth under control. We now expect future growth of 1.5% a year, well below the growth of the economy. Year after year, this government's also vigorously attacked fraud, and we've reformed benefits to target them on those in genuine need. And the measures I now propose in this budget intensify these efforts yet again. We plan a further move to align the benefits paid to lone parents and couples with children, because both care for children. From April 1998, new awards of family premium and child benefit will be the same in value for lone parents as for couples. And we're introducing a number of measures on housing benefit and council tax benefit to ensure that those on benefits don't have a more comfortable lifestyle than some of those who are supporting themselves on modest incomes. Oh, that the, 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 contrary, the contrary is most unfair and most unwise, and full details will be made available later today by my right honourable friend, the Secretary of State for Social Security, who, with your permission, Mr Deputy Speaker, will speak later in the budget debate. In my budget two years ago, I announced a whole package of measures to help the unemployed get back to work, from improvements to the family credit system to national insurance holidays for employers taking on long-term unemployed people, and they're contributing to the steadily improving jobs position in this country. In this budget, I'm providing another £100 million worth of new money for new measures mainly targeted on people who've been unemployed for two years or more. First, they'll be required to attend a compulsory programme of interviews with the Employment Service to give them a helping hand to compete in our ever-improving market for jobs. But we're also expanding project work pilots to a further 28 areas. This will create up to 100,000 new opportunities on a program with a good track record for getting long-term unemployed people back to work. The pilots of it have been successful. And I can also announce pilots for a new scheme called Contract for Work. Private contractors will help people to find work. These firms will be paid by results. As with, as with project work, if the scheme works better than the existing approach, we'll expand it. If we've drawn on some American experience, we'll adapt it to here, and if it works, we'll certainly put it into widespread application. We have to tackle this problem. Dependency on welfare impoverishes us all. Uh, the welfare system should provide a safety net. The welfare system must provide the support that a caring society wants to give to our less fortunate fellow citizens. But the welfare system must never to be allowed to become a way of life. We don't want our social security system to be undermined by resentment. We have to take these careful measures. We have to move people from dependency into responsibility for themselves and their families because we're serious about protecting those in genuine need and we want to go on delivering that protection for the future. Now, we want to combine a strong, affordable welfare system with a successful, low-tax economy. And that means that when we spend money on Social Security, it must only go to those who actually need it. It also means that when we levy taxes, we must make sure they're paid and not evaded by those who ought to pay them. And as part of our continuing fight against tax and benefit fraud and against tax loopholes, I'm introducing a package of measures called Spend to Save. This involves planned spending of money carefully targeted to save much more money for the general public and to raise revenue. There will be more money next year to clamp down on benefit fraud. There will be more risks and checks on benefit claimants in high-risk groups, and the information we already have on benefit claimants will be used more effectively to catch cheats. Inland revenue tax experts will be redeployed to investigate even more rigorously how some big, sophisticated companies seem to pay so little taxation. They'll make, sure that companies, they'll make sure that companies are paying what they owe and what we intend that they should owe. In short, we intend to do more about companies being economical with their tax. There'll be more resources, more resources in the revenue and customs to stem the growth of the shadow economy. 
Tax cheats put law-abiding small entrepreneurs out of business, and we all lose from that. There will be more customs and excise officers to ca tackle value-added tax and other tax abuse, including yet more to target the smuggling of alcohol and tobacco. The Spend to Save package will cost £800 million over the next three years to secure, in a well-planned and measured way, revenue and expenditure savings of well over eight times that amount, £6.7 billion. And these are additional measures to the effective steps we have previously taken. Spend to Save protects the ordinary taxpayer and the people in genuine need of benefits. It's Certainly not about more bureaucracy or red tape. We remain a government committed to deregulation and we are committed to a more efficient civil service. We have cut overall central government departments running costs by 8% in real terms since the start of this parliament and we are going to reduce them by a further 7% by the end of the decade. Civil service, numbers, or civil service numbers are already below half a million, and we expect this fall to continue. Now, the first duty of government is to make sure that people can live their lives as they want and that businesses can flourish. People must have the opportunity of a good quality job to go to, a good standard of living, good schools and hospitals, and safe streets to live in. And it's only when those essentials are secure and only when the government has made sure that it's not borrowing more than it should that a responsible government can start to think about tax cuts. Last year I cut taxes paid by the ordinary family and this year I'm able to cut a little more. And I think that the message I've repeated over recent months has now been understood. There are to be tax cuts, in my opinion they must be for keeps. That means they must be backed not only by sound spending decisions, but also by a sound fiscal judgment. Consumer spending is strong and inflation remains in check, but a fiscal stimulus to the economy at this stage could be just as damaging as letting go of monetary policy. So in setting my budget, I've struck a careful balance. I want to cut taxes, but first I have to continue my drive to secure the tax yield. I want to make sure that the tax due is turned into tax paid and the balance of the tax burden must be distributed sensibly and fairly and it mustn't distort decisions or competition. So I'm introducing a number of measures which will help to achieve this. And I'm plugging some loopholes <laughs> to raise revenue. I'm ending some tax reliefs that have done their job to raise revenue. And I'm adjusting some indirect tax rates. Even though VAT revenues have revived in recent months, they're still coming in significantly below what was expected last year. And this budget includes a crackdown on some of the rather ingenious wheezes that have sprung up to get around paying VAT. The measures I'm announcing will raise three quarters of a billion pounds in revenue next year, but they also protect a further one and a half billion pounds a year of existing revenue from further attack from ingenious accountants, acting lawfully, acting to take our revenue. Customs will restrict access to special VAT schemes for retailers. We'll also tighten up the rules of VAT relief schemes for bad debts and the option to tax commercial property to prevent widespread abuse of these reliefs. I also propose to take steps against retailers who reduce their VAT bills when selling insurance with their products. We've already announced a three-year limit on repayments of VAT claims. This was a sensible precautionary measure in, in the national interest, not just the Exchequer. Recent high profile court cases have revealed the potential exposure of the Exchequer to claims, enormous claims for tax, going back to when VAT was first introduced. No responsible government could leave the Exchequer and ultimately all taxpayers exposed in that way. Government needs to strike a balance between what's fair to the individual taxpayer and what is fair to the whole body of other taxpayers. And the three-year cap that I've announced strikes that balance. But one feature that attracted particular criticism, not only from accountants and their clients, but from others, was that customs still retained the right 
to claim underpaid tax going back six years. Now, the argument was actually, in my opinion, rather disingenuous because customs don't claim uh, underpaid tax on unexpected changes to the interpretation of the law when they go against taxpayers. However, government must not only be fair, it must be seen to be fair. And I've therefore decided that customs' right to claim underpaid tax in cases where no fraud or malpractice is involved should be restricted to three years as well. Yeah. I'll be releasing details today of a package of measures to stamp out tax abuse in a number of areas, including leasing transactions, the abuse of foreign tax credit rules, and paying employees in their own company's shares. And I'm sure that these will be accepted by the House and others as necessary and sensible measures to stem the growing loss of tax revenues and thereby to protect the ordinary taxpayer. I won't tolerate tax abuse, and a number of these measures are being introduced subject to the finance bill becoming law with effect from today. Special tax reliefs can be a powerful tool. They can play an important pump priming role, encouraging companies and individuals to change their behaviour in a way which benefits the wider economy. But by their very nature, they need to be used very selectively. We owe it, Mr Deputy Speaker, to the ordinary taxpayer <coughs> to keep each and every special tax review relief we have under constant review to determine whether it's still justified or whether it's now served its useful purpose. The tax relief this government introduced in 1987 to promote profit-related pay schemes has been a success. It's played a key role in reinforcing this government's strong beliefs that employees' rewards should depend on the success of the business for which they work. I've always believed, I've always argued publicly for many years that in a modern enterprise economy, people's pay should be closely linked to the performance of the business for which they work. The best way for businesses to motivate their staff is to let them share in the rewards of success. And I'm delighted that the tax reliefs have helped to get this idea accepted so widely. The tax relief on profit-related pay was always intended to be a pump-priming measure and was introduced in very different circumstances. Oh, yes. If I may quote what Nigel Lawson said in the Green Paper in 1986, I quote, There's considerable inertia to overcome, so it might make, some sense, might make sense to offer some temporary measure of tax relief. And I end the quote. Profit-related pay is now firmly established as part of British businesses' pay policy. It's one of the reasons for our success. Over 3.7 million people are in schemes. Ten years on, the temporary tax incentive has successfully served its pump-priming purpose. I can no longer justify the ever-increasing cost of the tax relief to the 22 million taxpayers who are not in profit-related pay schemes. We can't permanently divide the workforce into groups who pay different levels of tax on exactly the same earnings, depending <coughs> on whether the firm they work for is in a scheme or not. The goal, the aim of the relief, uh, 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 that it should achieve widespread use of profit-related pay, has been achieved. And I'd rather make faster progress on lower taxes for everybody. We have changed the culture. Good managers in this enterprise economy today do not need a tax relief anymore to know that pay should be linked to their firm's performance. Pay linked to profits produces its own rewards on the bottom line in a thriving economy. So I therefore propose to describe to the House how the government will start to withdraw this special tax relief. I do intend to do this gradually. So I need to ensure that businesses need to adjust their pay packages and their sharing of the rewards of success, uh, and they need to have ample time to make those adjustments. The upper limit of pay attracting the relief will remain unchanged at its present £4,000 until 1998. So that means that no one will be affected before then. It will then... But during, but, but, Mr. Deputy Speaker, but during the lifetime of a Conservative government. Yeah. It will then be progressively reduced until the year 2000, when the relief 
will be withdrawn altogether. I turn now to investment, because investment is vital to our recovery, and business investment now growing strongly. The tax system recognises investment through capital allowances. These allow the cost of investment to be written off against tax bills, frequently faster than it's written off in commercial accounts. But within that system, for plant and machinery with a long lifespan, the rate at which costs can be written off for tax is far more generous than for other types of investment, and it bears no relation to the useful economic life of the asset. And this is an unjustifiable distortion in the tax system in favour of particular types of business and investment. I propose changing the capital allowance for plant and machinery with a life of more than 25 years to 6% on a reducing balance basis. This will spread the tax relief more evenly over the average life of these assets. Groups spending less than £100,000 a year on such assets will be exempt. So this will mean that the vast majority of small companies will not be affected. Ships and railways will also be exempt. And I also propose to withdraw the 100% corporation tax reduction for the intangible costs of drilling most production oil wells. This government recognises that low marginal tax rates on income are a spur to hard work and enterprise. Taxes on spending do less damage to effort and enterprise than taxes on income. But the balance of the taxes that we do impose on spending must be right. And I'm making some changes to taxes which help to move towards a better balance for the tax system as a whole. <coughs> I propose to increase insurance premium tax, which applies to most general insurance, to 4%. Three quarters of all insurance, including life insurance and other long-term insurance, will remain exempt. Insurance remains undertaxed for consumers compared with other services in this country. The introduction of this tax, when I made it at a very low rate, didn't harm the healthy insurance industry that we have. Most companies absorbed the tax and some premier actually fell for a time. Even after this further modest change, which I think is lower than many people expected, the overall rate of insurance premium tax in the United Kingdom remains very low, lower than in almost any other European Union country. Air travel has also been under tax because it's proved difficult, still proves difficult, to get international agreement to tax its fuel. The rates of air passenger duty are to be increased. The £5 rate on flights to most European countries will be increased to £10, and the £10 rate on flights to the rest of the world will be increased to £20. These increases will not come into effect until the 1st of November 1997. To give... Labour again pointing out that that will happen after the election. I, I, I realise, Mr Deputy Speaker, that we're all thinking of a forthcoming election, but the, the, op the reason the opposition can't produce a responsible economic policy is plainly because they're obsessive about it. The, the, the very good reason for delaying it till November 1997 is, is to give tour operators who have already sold their packages time to reflect these new rates in the prices they publish in their holiday brochures. <laughs> I, announce, I announce necessary things before an election. That is responsibility. That is what is totally lacking from that side of the House, who seem to propose to announce nothing whatever of any substance apart from a windfall tax this side of the election. Business travel is soaring, and the holiday business is booming at the moment in prosperous Britain. This modest change won't stop it booming in future prosperous years. About 40% of the revenue raised by aircraft airport passenger tax is borne by overseas visitors to this country. I'm making the same changes to the main vehicle excise duties this year as I did last year. Cost of a car tax disc will go up by £5 around the rate of inflation. The cost of a lorry tax disc will be frozen, and that's for the seventh year in succession. 
I firmly believe that motorists should bear the full costs of driving, not only wear and tear and congestion on the roads, but also the wider environmental costs. Even those of us who frequently have to drive, and contrary to rumours that ministers always travel in limousines, that includes most people in this house, uh, we, we can take steps to cut fuel consumption, and we all ought to consider carefully the use of our cars. I intend to stick to my 1993 budget commitment to raise road fuel duties by an average of at least 5% each year in real terms. And in line with this, I'm raising the tax on all petrol and diesel by three pence per litre from six o'clock tonight. These tax rises will encourage fuel efficiency and they'll help control harmful pollution. I'm glad to say that pollution from vehicles is already coming down, helped by tax measures in previous budgets. The tax measures that we took to encourage unleaded petrol were a huge success and it now accounts for two thirds of the petrol market. I want to go further in this budget for green purposes, or to put it more sensibly, to attack pollution in cities and improve air quality by effective steps to reduce particulate emissions, which is the smoke produced by diesel engines. In recent years, new evidence has come to light strengthening the health arguments for reducing particulates. This pollution is being reduced, but we all want to see it being reduced further and faster. Ultra-low sulphur diesel is cleaner than ordinary diesel, and it's slightly more expensive to produce. So I want to create the conditions where ultra-low sulphur diesel can cost the same at the pump as ordinary diesel. I've just said that I'm increasing the tax on diesel by the same amount as petrol. I plan to reduce the duty on ultra-low sulphur diesel by a penny a litre relative to ordinary diesel when I get the necessary international agreement. I also want to encourage high mileage vehicles in our towns and cities to switch to cleaner gas power. Last year's budget changes broadly equalised the pump prices of liquid gas and petrol. From six o'clock tonight, I'm reducing the duty on road fuel gases by a further 25%. I also intend to reduce vehicle excise duty by up to £500 for lorries meeting very stringent emission standards from early 1998. This will, this will give an incentive for lorry owners to fit particulate traps or to convert to gas power. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We will be consulting on the practical details of these changes. I believe that this package, which is an air quality package, will significantly speed up the reduction of urban emissions of particulates helping us to meet our air quality targets for 2005 and beyond. We intend to ensure that the economic growth which we are achieving faster than others in this country is consistent with a healthy environment and is consistent with sustainable development as we become one of the most successful economies in the Western world. In my 1993 budget, I gave a commitment to raise duty on tobacco by more than inflation each year. I believe, I accept, it's a fair and effective way to hammer home the message <coughs> smoking can seriously damage your health. <coughs> so far as I'm concerned, this announcement is necessary masochism in the wider public interest, but <laughs> from six o'clock this evening, the tax on a packet of 20 cigarettes will increase about 15, by about 15 pence, on a packet of small cigars by about seven pence, and on a packet of pipe tobacco by about eight pence. But I'm limiting the increase in the duty on hand rolling tobacco to the rate of inflation. Hand rolling tobacco is proving by far the easiest tobacco product to smuggle, although it does represent a very small part of the total tobacco market. I'm aware, not yet. <laughs> I'm aware of the serious problem that cross border shopping and smuggling of alcohol causes our drinks industry in Britain. And I've already announced that uh, Customs are stepping up their efforts yet further to catch smugglers. Now, last year, I was able to freeze the duty rate on beer and wine. This year, it will remain frozen. The proportion of tax on the price of a pint in the pub is now at its lowest level for 30 years. And for some of us, that uh, helps to keep our small cigars affordable. <laughs> Last year's cut in the duty on spirits was the first cut that any chancellor had made for a hundred years. I was tempted to maintain a striking rate of once every hundred years. 
but I'm sure the industry will be glad to know they won't have to wait so long this time. From 6 o'clock tonight, the tax on whisky, gin and other spirits will fall by another 4% worth 26, 26 pence a bottle. And at, at cabinet, well, at, well the, the reduction in the rate on spirits boosts an important industry in the United Kingdom. But also reinforced last year's signal to overseas authorities not to discriminate against our products. Only smugglers will regret that we're slowly moving our duty on spirits nearer to the continental level. From the 1st of January, the tax on alcoholic soft drinks will be increased by over 40 per cent. Puts up the price by over seven and eight pence a bottle for those who have not yet tried them. This will meet public concern about the attraction of these alco pops for underage drinkers, but actually also attack a distortion of competition by bringing the tax broadly in line with beer. And uh, you'll notice that I've considered the balance of my overall package on this subject carefully. Uh, I haven't yet been converted to a bubblegum flavoured alco pop myself. <laughs> Nothing matters more for a business than a stable economic environment. Low interest rates and low inflation. And businesses throughout Britain are benefiting from the healthy, sustainable growth in the economy that I've described today. As I promised in my last budget, from April 1997, there'll be a cut in the main rate of employers' national insurance contributions to 10%. That'll be paid for by the proceeds we're getting from the landfill tax. A tax on waste is cutting a tax on jobs. And this will benefit employers in Britain and make it even cheaper to create new jobs in our growing economy. Our overheads on jobs are already less than half of those in Germany, France or Italy. And I'm determined that we've got to keep that advantage over our continental competitors, where the creation of new jobs in the rest of the European Union is overregulated and it's overpriced. And that's another reason why I'm confident, a practical reason for being confident that our unemployment will keep falling. In this budget, I propose to keep the three intermediate thresholds for employers' national insurance contributions where they are now. I propose to increase by £10 and £1 respectively the upper and lower earnings thresholds for employers' and employees' national insurance contributions. In this budget, I also want to address a particular concern of our small businesses upon whom so much of our future economic prosperity depends. And I think they're most concerned about the burden of non-domestic rates. The uniform business rates are fixed cost which can rise each year beyond the control of the manager of any business, and it hits the small business hard. Since the last revaluation of business rates, I've repeatedly slowed down the increase of rates for those, whose business, those businesses whose rates have had to go up. No business property has seen its rates go up by more than 7.5% above inflation in any one year since the last revaluation. Uh, but I want to do more than that. That is not good enough. I have decided to freeze next year's rates bill for all the small businesses whose rates would have gone up. Small properties whose rates are falling will have those reductions accelerated. This will benefit over one million small business properties by up to £130 a year. And I want to go further. A freeze is an important step, significant step, and I can make that straight away this year. We've already reduced business rates for rural village shops. Uh, but I realise that the present system of business rates bears particularly hard on the smaller businesses for whom they represent a much bigger proportion of total costs compared with their large competitors. We must therefore move on as soon as possible to make more, more changes in the system to recognise this and to redistribute the burden more sensibly between smaller and larger businesses. We'll proceed to do that, and my budget next year will be a convenient opportunity to do so. <laughs> this government's committed to reducing and then abolishing capital gains tax and inheritance tax, and I repeat those commitments. 
but we have always said that we will cut these taxes only we can afford when we can afford to do so. This is a responsible budget which is protecting future growth and prosperity by putting the public finances into a healthier state. And we won't be able to make progress on both those taxes this year. But I am pleased to announce that we can take come, come back next year and discover, I would say, to the, from the seat which, your, which the Honourable Member is now occupying, he will find out. But, but I'm pleased to announce that we can take a further significant step towards abolishing inheritance tax. Inheritance tax is actually, a, nowadays, a penalty on thrift, independence and enterprise. It's a growing anachronism. Lloyd George uh, Maxim, when he said that the most convenient time to tax the rich is when they're dead, uh, no longer holds in modern society. Inheritance tax today is largely paid by people of modest means, who either cannot or simply do not make careful plans to avoid it. Modest means in the opinion of all those outside the hardcore of the labour movement, that is. Last year I made significant progress towards our commitment. In this budget, I will build on that by raising the value of the inheritance tax threshold to £215,000. Yeah, Only £200,000. I know that from this morning. Does he also aware this government has therefore now raised that threshold by 40%, 40% in only two years? In last year's budget speech, I announced a project to rewrite inland revenue tax legislation in plain English. As a tall order, this project is about as ambitious as uh, translating the whole of war and peace into lucid Swahili. But, uh, in, well, in fact, it's more ambitious. I'm told that war and peace is only 1,500 pages long. Inland revenue tax law is 6,000 pages long, and it wasn't written by a Tolstoy. But we. <laughs> We, we've consulted extensively on how the project should be carried out, and I'm glad to say there is wide consensus. The Inland Revenue will publish the plans and arrangements shortly after the budget. The aim is to prepare a series of rewrite bills, the first of them to be ready for enactment in the 1997 to 98 session. My noble and learned friend Lord Howes produced a thorough and helpful report on how Parliament might handle these bills. We endorse his broad proposals and invite the Procedure Committee consider how the House is going to handle the bills in that fashion. And I can announce that my noble and learned friend, Lord Howe, has agreed to chair the steering committee which will oversee the rewrite project. The project will bring the benefits of clarity and certainty to businesses and ordinary taxpayers. It's been widely welcomed and it deserves the continuing support that it has enjoyed in all parts of this House. Mr Deputy Speaker, this Government has led Britain towards our clear goal of a low-tax economy where private enterprise has the incentive to generate jobs, investment and wealth to make people and their families more prosperous. We are moving towards a low tax economy where individual living standards continue to rise and the government can afford the excellent public services that people want. <coughs> low direct tax taxes are the most effective way to encourage enterprise and hard work, a message to which we haven't converted the other party but one which they no longer dare to deny. Under this government, those who do an honest day's work and those who take entrepreneurial risk will keep more of what they earn and save by their own efforts. This year, people have taken more heed of my speeches on the overriding priority for this year of securing future prosperity and jobs and financing key public services. Sensible people already expect my cuts in direct taxation to be modest before they read the one leak and many guesses this morning. They know their well-being depends on lasting growth and more jobs and that living standards rise from a combination of steadily rising incomes in a successful economy and steadily lowering taxes. Tax cuts matter a lot to low-paid people and to men and women in ordinary jobs. And I announced my income tax cuts last year as a return to our tax-cutting agenda. And for the second year in succession, as a result of all the steps that I have announced, I am able to afford to deliver an instalment of that agenda. The choice is how. How best to deliver. It's the old dilemma. Do you go for thresholds or do you go for rates? Uh, and today I suppose I'd say, do you go for the Guardian or do you go for the Mirror? Do you go for the Independent or do you go for the Sun? 
Well, Mr Deputy Speaker, I want to ensure that tax doesn't start to be paid at all at too low a level of income. And I want to improve work incentives. So therefore, I propose to raise the threshold below which no income tax is paid at all. In this budget, I'm making an increase in the basic personal allowance of £280. Let me put this in context. This is two, that is three and a half times more than necessary to cover the rate of inflation. And it will also ensure that each and every person who pays any income tax at all will get a direct benefit out of this budget. I'm also increasing the married couples and the related allowances by £40, maintaining the extra tax allowance that does go to all married couples. It will now be worth nearly £275 each year for couples who are married. The tax system does recognise marriage, contrary to popular belief. We also give a special tax allowance to blind people. This year I'm increasing that by the rate of inflation, <coughs> but I'm also moving to put indexation of this allowance onto the same statutory basis as for the other income tax allowances. I also propose to raise the threshold above which people start to pay the 40 pence rate, higher rate tax, by £600. Now, one of this government's most important pleasures is that we will move to a basic rate of income tax of 20 pence as soon as we can. Uh, now, we're proving that we can move towards the delivery of the promise and still deliver healthy public finances. Every step we take makes it more and more credible. Every step that we take makes it more affordable to reach the ultimate goal which we are getting tantalisingly near to and which a Conservative government will achieve. And as a further step towards that, I propose to widen the lower rate band of 20 pence uh, tax by £200, and that's twice as much as required uh, to meet inflation. And that will mean that the slice of income on which a 20 pence tax rate is paid will have more than doubled during the lifetime of this Parliament. More than one in a four, more than a quarter of all taxpayers now will only pay a marginal rate of tax at 20 pence in the pound. Yeah. Well, Mr Deputy Speaker, why thresholds? Were the newspapers wrong? Am I indeed going to cut a penny off the basic rate of income tax? Well, what the newspapers didn't know, at least, was that my control of public spending and borrowing and the responsibility of my budget as a whole means I can raise thresholds. I can widen the 20 pence uh, uh, band, and actually I can also responsibly afford to take down income tax as well. If I put it all on the rates, I actually could have taken two pence off income tax, the basic rate, on the measures I've announced. But I preferred instead to raise personal alliances and widen the 20 pence ban for those at the bottom end of the scale. Yes, Mr Deputy Speaker, I'm indeed also, on top of that, able to reduce the basic rate of income tax by one penny to 23 pence in the pound. The small companies, the small companies' rate of corporation tax will be reduced to 23 pence in line with this, helping 400,000 companies. The main rate of corporation tax of 33 pence is already lower than in any other major industrialised country. Look forward to see what the Labour Party say about the level of the basic rate of income tax. 17 years of steady progress so far means that the basic rate of income tax we now have is actually a full 10 pence lower than the rate we inherited in 1979. The standard rate in this country is now the lowest it's been for nearly 60 years. Since Stanley Baldwin was Prime Minister, since Wally Hammond scored a double century at the Oval. And another penny off the basic rate is significant further step towards this government's target of a 20 pence basic rate of tax. For over 7 million people, our promise of a 20 pence basic rate is already a reality, and bringing other income taxpayers ever closer to that reality. 20 pence is a realistic and attainable goal for the next Parliament, and we won't be content till we've completed the task 
of getting it down to 20 pence, and every budget I presented has step by step shown how we are going to get there. With increases in real earnings and all the tax changes in this budget, a family on average earnings will be another £370 better off next year over and above inflation. Did it last time and it happened. Same family will have over £1,100 more to spend after tax and inflation than they did before they voted Conservative at the last general election. Yeah. And in 1992, the background was one of a worldwide slowdown. Now we're enjoying strong growth and rising living standards, and we're going to enjoy more of the same. Mr Deputy Speaker, in November 1993, I promised that I would put Britain firmly on course for a sustained period of rising prosperity and falling unemployment based on low inflation and healthy public finances. I have done what I clearly said I would have to do and I have delivered on those promises. This budget cuts public spending next year by £2 billion. It generates an extra half a billion pounds in revenue through spend to save. It contains a balanced tax package and it includes tax cuts of £2 billion whilst it secures the tax base by £1 billion. Taken together, the effect of the budget is to tighten fiscal policy and so protect healthy, lasting recovery and still achieve our target of cutting the basic rate and moving towards our 20p goal. I'm a man of the world, Mr Speaker. I realise virtue doesn't always bring its own, re own rewards and I'm probably not a particularly virtuous Chancellor. But this virtuous budget will bring rich rewards, the rewards of economic success to the hard-working men on this, women in this country who are now in the best economic situation they've seen for years. And it will bring rewards to government. Never forget, good economics is good politics. This isn't a budget just for the next few months. It's a budget for many prosperous years to come. And it's a budget that Conservative government will build upon again in 12 months' time. I commend this budget to the House. Well, some of those tax changes announced by Kenneth Clark, but not new taxes, can come into effect immediately by virtue of the Provisional Collection of Taxes Act 1968. Now, there'd be a single motion taken, which is normally agreed without a division to approve those measures. Then the Chancellor will move the amendment of the law motion before five full days of debate on the budget are opened by the Leader of the op Opposition, Tony Blair. But the question is that Thank you, Carolyn. Well, now let's just have a look at the budget as announced by the Chancellor who just sat down. These are the main changes. The basic rate of income tax is cut by one penny to 23 pence. The lower rate, the 20 pence band, is widened by 200. That's 100 more than it would have needed just for indexation. And a big change on allowances. The point at which you start paying tax, the personal allowance, goes up by 280 pounds, and the married couple's allowance goes up indexed by £40, and he said that was to show that there were advantages for the married couples in tax, contrary to what people said. Duties. Uh, cigarettes go up by 15 pence a pack, and there are similar changes to cigars and pipe tobacco, but no change in beer and wine for the second year running, and spirits go down by 26 pence a bottle, moving it towards continental prices for spirits. And then motoring changes. The Chancellor announced that the Tax disc on your motor car goes up by five pounds, that's indexed, and all petrol and diesel, uh, with the exception of uh, special diesel that doesn't emit uh, dangerous, noxious um, substances, that most of them go up by three pence a litre. So that's the uh, changes that the Chancellor has announced in broad detail. Peter Snow now has those tax cuts, um, and he's up in Merry Hill in Dudley. Let's join him, Peter. Right, well, David, look then at the direct tax changes for a whole range of married couples on these annual incomes. Here we are from £5,000 on the left here right the way across to £100,000. Thanks to the Institute of Fiscal Studies, we can calculate these changes in pay, in other words, in what you take home, uh, only on direct tax, on the income tax cuts, the effect is. Married couple on £5,000, including the married couple's allowance, they don't pay any tax at the moment anyway, so no change for them. 
but it goes up that weekly benefit that you get, that weekly tax cut goes up to some of average earnings with £3.84 and up the top there because of the basic rate going down by a penny, £8 better, £8.50, £8.50 for the first £100,000, that's your weekly tax cut. David. Thanks very much. Well, now let's go to the House of Commons, where Tony Blair, the leader of the opposition, well, is giving his immediate response. They may not like to hear the facts, but they're going to get the facts from us and not from the Chancellor. Right. Tax. Let's start with tax. One thing we now know for certain is that taxes will be higher at the next election than the last, and that the Conservative Party that fought that election on the promise it would cut tax will after all the changes made today, leave the average British family £2,120 worse off in tax. Worse off in tax. And Mr Deputy Speaker, yes, yes, Mr Deputy Speaker, the Chancellor announced a crackdown on tax cheats. I think he should start with the Conservative Party. Yeah. 22 Tory tax rises. Mortgage tax relief cut. Married couples allowance cut, not made up for by what he did today. National insurance raised, not compensated for by what he did today. VAT raised. We didn't hear much about VAT, did we? It's as if that was never touched. And he said, of course, that the Conservatives have brought down the burden of tax. The burden of tax, if you take into account all the Tory taxes, is higher now for the average family than it was. Now, I was going to say, as a result of the, of the budget and what we thought was coming up, I was going to say, well, 7 minus 2, that's 7 pence in the standard rate, the equivalent of that, that they put up taxes, minus 2 equals 5. And I thought that was going to be good enough. That would be too generous. Because let me tell you, Mr Deputy Speaker, the other point that you notice when you go through the facts is that they're back to their old Tory tricks. Yeah. Let them just confirm this, that council tax on their figures is due to be put up by £4 billion over the next three years. That's a 6% rise. Right? Profit-related pay, of course. Well, he said that wouldn't bite until next year. But let me just get him to confirm. Some of those people on profit-related pay are low-paid workers. Some of them will face a change in their income when all those changes come into effect. That's the equivalent of about eight pence on the standard rate of tax. We heard nothing about that. But, Mr Deputy Speaker, there was also the insurance tax going up, the airport tax going up, the measures on loan parents, the measures on company cars. Give with one hand, take with another. That's the record of the Tories over the years. And, Mr Deputy Speaker, we may like to ask just how credible the government tax promises now are. Let me read from something days before the last election. In fact, in the budget before the last general election. This is what the then Chancellor had to say. He said, I now turn to value-added tax. I have a very important announcement to make to which I hope the whole House will listen carefully. I have no need, no proposals, and no plans either to raise or to extend the scope of VAT. If they told those untruths then, why should we believe them now, no matter what they say? But I thought, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, I thought perhaps the most extraordinary point that he made was these great cuts in public spending that were going to come about as a result of the closure of loopholes and a more effective policing of the tax regime. I have to point out to him, the Chancellor, that when my right honourable friend used to talk about loopholes, this is what he said. He said that the, the problem was they didn't exist. That my right honourable friend was living in an Alice in Wonderland fantasy. <laughs> now, now his spending plans rest upon those. And can I just make another point to him? He says that apparently there are going to be, this is, this is what the uh, press releases say, there are going to be 2,000 extra Inland Revenue civil servants, that's right, who are going to be hammering down on... Sorry? I'm sorry, these things are already being put yeah, out by the government. Up, Perhaps yeah. he's not aware of that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I see. 
Perhaps he thinks perhaps he thinks that although the Chancellor is able to say these things, we're not able to respond to them in any way. <laughs> 2,000 extra civil servants, apparently. Now, let me just quote the House this figure. Let me just quote the House this figure. According to the Chancellor, he is going to get out of these changes, out of apparently cracking down on tax avoidance and loopholes, £7 billion in the next few years. £7 billion. First of all, their Alice in Wonderland fantasy, and now the entirety of the government's spending plans rest on these things. And of course, he says that, that borrowing is all going to come down. Mr Deputy Speaker, let me remind them of another promise that they made. At the last election, the Prime Minister proclaimed that he was going to cut the national debt. That's what he said. Borrowing was going to come down. According to the government, before the last election, perhaps the Chancellor will recall this, before the last election, the borrowing requirement by 94-95 was going to be zero. It was actually 44 billion. This year, it was supposed to be, on the original plans, 6 billion. It's now 26 billion. This Prime Minister, having won an election on the pledge that he would cut taxes and cut debt, has doubled the national debt. As a result of that, and this is again a figure he didn't give. He was very coy, actually, about the figures that he did give at certain parts of this budget. According to the government's own figures, the interest payments on that debt will amount to £25 billion a year. That is more than we spend on law and order. That is more than we spend on defence from a government that promised to cut taxes and cut borrowing. And, of course, Mr Deputy Speaker, he says that one of the other ways that he's going to get this money is through our old friend, the Public Finance Initiative. Yeah. That, hey, presto, suddenly yeah. this money's, suddenly this money's, well, they want me to give some details of that. Fortunately, 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 I'm able to do that again. <laughs> Last year, the Tory party said in the budget that it was going to build 12 new hospitals. The contracts would be signed, a hospital a month would be signed off. Can I tell the House how many hospital contracts have actually been agreed? One. Well, we leave the House of Commons uh, and Tony Blair at the start of his speech. There we'll have more of that later on in this programme, but our job is to try and explain to you what happened in the Chancellor's budget and how it affects the economy. And let's just have a look, first of all, at the overall picture of what the Chancellor was trying to achieve. This was his forecast in this budget. Growth was forecast in 1997 to be at 3.5%. Inflation, that's next year, of course, inflation was going to meet the 2.5% target. Government borrowing, the PSBR, 26.5 billion in 96.7, and next year, 97.8, falling to 19 billion. And he said, incidentally, the criteria that had to be met by 97, if we're to go into the single currency, the Maastricht criteria, would on this basis be met uh, in, in, uh, in due time. Now, Bridget Rosewell, what, what's he done? Well, he says he's tightened on fiscal policy, and indeed he has, but on the other hand, the tightening that he's done is so minuscule as to be well within margins of error on the forecasting of tax revenues, which, as he said himself, has uh, been fairly problematic in recent years. So he's, uh, he's well within the kind of middle-of-the-road budget. He's done what everybody has been telling him to do. He's been done what everybody has been expecting and hoping, which is cautious, prudent, tiny bit here, tiny bit there, a lot of sound and fury signifying not terribly much. And what's your view of his view of the economy, that it's not growing very fast, just growing steadily? I mean, he's right. still borrowing a lot of money for the fifth year of recovery. Well, right? absolutely, and, and, and we certainly think that 97 will be the peak year of recovery. And uh, on his figures, he's still got 19 billion of borrowing, and he's going to hit the Maastricht criteria. But uh, that's supposed to be a maximum, not a minimum. It's uh, this uh, point in the cycle that you should be borrowing the least amount of money because things are going reasonably well, expecting it to rise when things get worse. So uh, he's, he's still, as far as the government finance is concerned, it's still not a totally happy situation. Uh, Peter Jay, our economics editor, do you think he's done the right things, or do you think he should have done something different? I think it's very interesting what comes out of the Red Book. 19 billion is what we heard is the deficit plan for next year. That is now planned to come down to and turn into a surplus, not until the year 2000, one year later than in the Red Book, which he published uh, last year. Uh, a deficit, therefore, continuing at quite a high level, even when, according to his way of looking at the economy in 1998, we shall be 
way, way, way past the recession and no longer have that cyclical justification for having a deficit. Other interesting figures are the... Well, port- just, just on that point, yeah. before we go, I mean, the idea was, and, and uh, Norman Lamont had, that, and Nigel Lawson had this, didn't he, that, that you pay off debt during a period of recovery. You accumulate debt during recession and you pay it off in recovery. You're saying that they're, I mean, they're in danger of not paying it off at all on this basis. Well, he plans to be in actual surplus in the year 2001 by 18, 18 billion pounds. Will, will the recovery still be going on in the year 2001? It depends what has happened to inflation. Uh, if the economy is now, as the recent figures suggest, it may be anywhere near the ceiling, the limit on capacity, then it most certainly will not be going on. We shall have higher interest rates and we shall have to back off in order to bring inflation down. If, as we thought, growth had been continuing at the sort of rate that it's gone on ever since the war, about two and a quarter percent, then there's still lots of room left to continue expanding at about three percent a year, which is what the Chancellor is forecasting, to the end of the century. Interestingly, his forecast for the GDP, three and a half percent next year, easing down to three percent in 1998. His forecast for inflation for the RPI for next year is precisely two and a half percent, which is strictly speaking, therefore, just on the upside of his official central target, which is, quote, under two and a half percent. So is your view that he's being cautious or prudent or that he's doing the wrong thing? He's leaving it all to monetary policy. I mean, he has tightened the budget, reduced the budget deficit by one billion pounds. One billion, which is naught point, naught, naught, one, and a tiny bit percent of the economy. He has made no difference whatsoever. The real outturn will be five, ten times. Uh, that sum away from what he's actually said, because it always is within the margin of, uh, of error, as has correctly been said. So it's a budget that need never have happened? He's leaving it to monetary policy. He will go on with his monthly battles with Eddie George, the Governor of the Bank of England, as to whether or not he needs to lower interest rates or raise them if it turns out. And this is the crucial overriding thing, that we're anywhere near the zone where inflation begins to take off, then he's going to have to put his foot uh, on the brake uh, increasingly month by month. If we are near that zone, it means that everything that people believed about how the 1980s had improved the efficiency of the economy is untrue, that the long-term growth of the economy is actually slower than it was throughout the first 40 years after the war. And, and uh, Bridget, do you think there's a danger of interest rates going up? We're going to talk to businessmen in Leeds in just a moment. They'll be interested to know your view of that. I think that they probably will need to go up a little bit during 1997. I'm, uh, given that this is actually slightly tighter than most people, I mean, okay, it's all within margins of error, but I mean, in terms of the sorts of changes that people were expecting to make a few months ago, this is a bit tighter, and so that reduces the need for possible interest rate rises during the coming year. I agree with, with Peter that uh, one of the big things at issue is how much scope there is for um, faster growth in the economy. I also think, however, that uh, that varies sector to sector, day to day, depending on what levels of investment we're getting and so on. I'm concerned about investment levels. So I think that although the economy can grow at around two and a quarter percent along the long term growth path, that doesn't mean to say that next year won't be a year of pressure on inflation. Okay, well, listening to that with uh, Diana Medill in Leeds are a number of businessmen who will be directly affected by this. Diana. Indeed. Let's speak to Paul Dixon first of all. He has got a car company in Leeds, but you also use profit-related pay, and this is something that Ken Clark wants to phase out. What do you think of that? Yes, we do. Uh, we are a profit-related pay company, and we enjoy sharing the rewards and the success in the business with our employees. I'm disappointed that he's choosing to phase that out. I think that's an area where I'd like to see that the government provide more initiative. A uh, number of our employees, are, the take-home pay has increased and they're able to use that disposable income to secure better pensions for themselves individually. What about the rest of the budget, though, for business? Did you like it? From a motor industry point of view, I think it's a good budget. Um, the, the industry is showing signs of, of recovery, our particular uh, retail sector. The Chancellor has done nothing to dampen that. We can't argue with inflationary increases on things like fuel, etc., and on the, road, uh, on the road fund license. I think he's missed the opportunity to address the environmental issue regarding the amount of pollution that's uh, emitted by cars over 10 years old. And there's about one third of the cars on the road that are over 10 years old. I think he could have provided a tax incentive to do that, and it would have generated funds for the, uh, for the Treasury as well, because the VAT element would have been far greater than the incentive that he provided. Of course, that would have been very good business for you too. <laughs> Stuart Archibald, you're in the lorry business. What do you think of the, the budget? I think it's um, a very well-balanced budget. Um, but I have to say that he said at the outset that oil prices had increased um, sharply over the last year. In fact, they've gone up 15% of diesel prices. And now to add 3p to the price of diesel is an extremely high penalty on industry. That will cost industry something like £350 million. It'll have to be passed on. 
I think the idea, it won't affect, uh, it won't affect the environment one dot either, so that's, it's just a tax raising exercise. As far as reducing the tax on sulfur free diesel, I think that's the right idea, but a penny difference between that fuel and normal fuel isn't enough. Alex Begg, you're an environmental campaigner. What do you think of the budget? Well, there are a few scraps of comfort in there for us. Uh, the reduction in tax on uh, fuel gases uh, is something that Friends of the Earth in particular have been looking for for some time. And the increase in air passenger duty is, I think, long overdue. Uh, air traffic really needs to face the full environmental costs. Um, but the big global problems, particularly the greenhouse effect, there's an enormous amount of international concern that real serious action should be taken on this, and this doesn't look like a budget that faces up to that. Uh, we were looking for a carbon tax, and most importantly, for measures that would reduce the regressive impact of a carbon tax, and that hasn't happened. OK, well, let's find out what other small businesses make of what the Chancellor had to say. Now, Martin Thomas-Taylor, you're a publican. Are you going to reduce your prices now as a result of excise duties being lowered, certainly on, on spirits? Well, any benefits we get, obviously, we, we would hope that we can pass them on to the customers. So you will lower prices? Well, I, I hope that my company may, yes. However, you will put them up, I imagine, on alcohol pops. But... Um, possibly. I, I really can't answer for, for my company. So you're going to review the situation? Absolutely. OK. Yes. Martin Port, you're a small businessman. What do you make of what the Chancellor had to say? Cruise the European Bread started it on the Enterprise Allowance Scheme in January 1990 and through a Conservative government has done very very well and grown and I feel that this budget is a very good budget for small businesses. In particular? Um, in why? particular we've got lower uh, employers national insurance contribution, we've got lower uh, rates for businesses, small shopkeepers, we've got also a lower redu a reduction in, uh, in income tax and also uh, the most important thing is I feel interest rates will be kept down. Okay, Jill Fletcher, was it good for you in small business? Well, I'm glad that we've got a, a freeze on the uh, rates. It's uh, a good position to have a fixed income. I'd have preferred it to four, but it's better fixed. You know where you're going. And the cumulative effects of the other things will help us. Eric Sanderson, the same for you? Well, a, a, a predictably cautious budget, but on the whole, good news for interest rates, which will, will, will help keep uh, uh, inflation in check and encourage investment. Somewhat disappointing is that, that there's little direct uh, incentive uh, uh, for investment for the manufacturing sector. OK, so a good budget as far as businesses are concerned, but could do a bit better. David. Thanks very much, Dana. Uh, news, the British insurer's reaction to that increase in the uh, tax on insurance policies. We're saddened and disappointed at this regressive tax on the prudent uh, insurance is not a luxury and shouldn't be treated as such. Well, let's hear how the city has reacted to this now and join Nisha Pillai. Nisha. David, yes, I'm in this vast dealing room here, the Deutsche Morgan Grenfell dealing room, and the dealers here have been busy crunching through the budget arithmetic. With me is their chief UK economist, James Barty. James, first off, how have the financial markets responded to the budget? Well, the financial markets uh, have responded broadly neutrally. It was um, pretty much as we expected. It was a prudent budget. And uh, to be honest, after the leaks in the newspapers this morning, there wasn't a tremendous amount in there that we hadn't anticipated, and therefore market reaction really has been very muted indeed. But does the budget arithmetic really add up? After all, the Chancellor was extremely optimistic about his forecast for inflation next year. Well, I think the uh, budget arithmetic does probably add up. Um, if you look at the tax cuts, they're quite modest. They're only about £2 billion or so. And he's financed those by tax increases elsewhere, some spending cuts. The Chancellor described it as a tight budget. I'm not sure I would really describe it as a tight budget. But having said that, he's surprised the city on the, uh, with his uh, budget deficit forecast because that's a bit lower than we'd expected at £19 billion rather than £20 billion. Oh, yeah, city economists have been agonising about public finances for some time now. So you're saying there was a pleasant surprise there? There was a small pleasant surprise. The, the budget arithmetic had actually been getting a little bit better in recent months as the economy had picked up, unemployment falling uh, and people's incomes rising. That means they may pay more taxes. And therefore, we had been looking for lower budget deficits. But the chance has given us an added bonus today uh, by lowering that number below £20 billion. But you couldn't have been pleased by his decision to phase out profit-related pay, presumably. Every other person here in the city seems to be on one of those kind of deals. Uh, well, I don't think we have our personal preferences uh, uh, in line here. What we're really thinking about are the implications for the market. It um, was a bit of a surprise, though, wasn't it, his decision to phase it out altogether? I think that uh, it was a little bit of a surprise. Um, and the rumours had been that he was going to scrap it all for next year. And to a certain extent, he's given up a bit of income by phasing it out over a few years. And to be really totally honest, the Chancellor could have been a lot more adventurous in this budget 
without really disturbing uh, analysts and, uh, and the markets. But the Chancellor's reputation for prudence is intact. Oh, the Chancellor's reputation for prudence is certainly intact. He said he would be prudent. He said that good economics makes good politics, and he's delivered on that today. James Marty, thanks for joining us for the moment. David. Thanks very much, Nisha. Well, now, how are our families getting on with Peter Snow up in Dudley? Looking at that budget, we saw them before, explaining how things stood and what they wanted. What are they going to get? Peter. David, they've been having a jolly good look at Ken Clark's shop window. Our six families here waiting with bated breath to see what he had to offer. And uh, they heard him say, you know, he wasn't going to be Santa Claus, but nor was he going to be Scrooge. And what was he going to give away? All these goodies in his window. And now, of course, we know the answer. So how are each of our families going to be better or worse off as a result of all these tax changes? Now, in front of them here, we have this large red button. And I'm going to ask them, as their picture comes up on the screen, and as their uh, little readout of their income and expenditure comes up on the screen, they're going to press the button, and that will tell us exactly what our computer says it's going to cost them, or indeed they'll reward them with, uh, in this budget. So let's, first of all, then start looking at these family fortunes by going down our uh, budget town street to the end of the street there, where the... Uh, council flats are, and we're going to see what happens first of all to our unemployed couple, Cliff and Fiona Duncombe, unemployed. There they are with their four children. Now, Cliff, would you press the button and we'll see what happens to you. To you. There we go. Your direct tax uh, effect is, of course, no change because you don't pay any tax. Mm -hmm. But indirect tax, you're gonna, it's going to cost you £1.28 more a week. Uh, and the effect of that, the actual net effect of that, you'd be worse off then by one pound twenty-eight a week. Now, why is that? Because you smoke a bit, do you, Cliff? Yeah, yeah. I, I drive, I smoke, and I drink a little bit. So petrol but tax not, up? Not anymore. <laughs> oh, no, well, actually, well, it's pity you don't drink a bit more. I mean, yeah. you know, because uh, that's, you've actually gone down on What about you, Fiona? How do you feel about that? Well, it doesn't actually surprise me that we're worse off, uh, because when you're unemployed, you haven't got any money anyway, so if they take some more off you, does it really matter? Uh, so this is not going to do you much good, this budget? No, it's do going to affect the children. Cliff, yeah. what, what, what are you... Well, bas basically, that's, uh, that's the price of uh, my, one of my children's drinks for school for the week. So they, they've literally taken the drinks off of one of my children for the week at school. So if I ask you whether this looks to you, either of you, like an election-winning budget for this Chancellor in this government, what are we going to say? Mm, no. no. <laughs> Not for the unemployed family with children, no. You do accept he had to be responsible with the economy. He hadn't got that much to go with. The borrowing, borrowing constraints were very high. He'd like to have given more away in tax cuts, perhaps reduced VAT if he'd been able to. Yeah, but, uh, but he wasn't able to. He hadn't got the money. So it's a, he would say a responsible budget. There, no? There, there is, no, well, there is other ways of doing that. I mean, um, the one thing is I drive a car and car tax is uh, he's put five pound on car tax and uh, i think that's unfair for somebody like me who um who, who doesn't drive okay. as much as say somebody who drives 24 hours a day say a rep or whatever that drives hundred thousand miles in a year okay let's move on up the street then and see what happens to our pensioner couple uh here they are john and doris bradley on ten thousand pounds a year now doris if you'd like to Bang the button down there, that's the stuff. Well done, and there's the effect on you of the direct tax changes. £1.82 better off, that the plus means you're better off at £1.82. That's because income tax uh, has been reduced, and of course the age allowances are up and so on. Indirect tax, you're worse off by 35 pence a week, and the net effect on you and John then is you're better off by £1.47 a week. What do you think of that? Well, it's not a lot, but every little helps, we know. I'm disappointed in the budget as a whole, though, because I don't think he's targeted his help at the people who need it most, um, the poorer people who probably don't pay income tax, so that doesn't make well, any difference Well, as we heard from Sip and Fiona, them, yes. But they do have to buy goods where petrol or diesel is used in the transporting of them to the shops, and obviously prices will rise, and they have to insure their houses. Now, of course, that would be worse for you, wouldn't it, John, if you smoked, but you don't. So that's mainly your increase in petrol tax, that 35 pence, I yes. suppose, isn't it? Yes, that would be the petrol and also the road tax. And... Uh, I'm disappointed that there was no reduction on VAT, uh -huh. on heating such like. That, that is the sort of tax that hits the lower paid people. Labour are committed to reduce that 8% to 5%. Now, are you going to, do you believe Labour that they will reduce it when they get, if they get the power? I will wait and see. Uh -huh. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you both very much for that. Let's move on then uh, up the street a bit and see what happens to our... 
at £12,000 a year. A couple, Brett and Sarah Baines, are on £12,000 a year. OK, Brett, hammer the button, that's it, and here we go. Direct tax, £2.38, better off, that's because income tax is down. Indirect tax, though, 90 pence worse off, and the net effect on you two is that you're better off by £1.48 a week. Well, now, uh, Brett, how about that? Why, why 90, pe 90 pence worse off? That's because you drive a car. Yeah, and I suppose the, the, the tax as well on the um, disc as well. How important is a car to you? Um, quite a bit, really, because we've got a little boy, so we need to take him to the nursery and also because I go to the gym and so on and so forth, and so we do need a car, really. Sarah? Um, I'm quite pleased to see that they've put spending into schools and hospitals, but um, the indirect taxes, again, I'm not amused with. Um, the insurance hits everybody across the spectrum. Yeah, you're um, still better off by £1.50-odd, <coughs> aren't you? Uh, nevertheless, but the Tories are renowned for bringing in backdoor taxes behind people's backs, so I'm afraid they've probably lost my vote this time. Oh, really? Yeah. So this hasn't persuaded you no, to vote Conservative? What about you, Brett? I wouldn't go and give them house space, basically, Conservatives anyway. Uh -huh. All right, let's go on up the road then and uh, see what happens to the family on average earnings. There they are. There's uh, Val and Colin Mitchell outside their house. I'm really not really looking a bit like your house. It's our budget town house, but, you know, a uh, bit of poetic license there. There's, uh, there's your two undergraduate uh, children. Now, let's see if you don't like to press it, Val. Thank you very much. Press the button, and we have direct tax changes then mean that you're £4.27 better off. And this is, don't forget, this is what the Chancellor would indeed call Middle England. This is the uh, average earnings couple. Indirect tax changes, £1.39 worse off. And the net effect on you then, Val, uh, better off by £2.88 a week. How about that? Well, I think they're robbing Peter to pay Paul again. I mean, the richer you are, the, the better off you're going to be. And we are taking it directly from the unemployed. I mean, they, they say that they're going to um, give more money to education, and particularly the universities. Well, part of it to the universities, but I'd like to know what, because it's certainly not on the grants, because that's all planned out for the next two years. Colin? Well, I agree wholeheartedly. I mean, when I... When it first came out that, that uh, there was going to be more money for education, I thought, oh, that's great. But I thought, then I thought, well, we lost £300 a year off the grant last year. We're going to lose £300 per person, that is, off next year. So I can't see where right. there's a figure of £2.88 a week. I can't see how that, oh, that can be true. Well, let's, let's go on up and see what the people on twice your income then. Uh, Peter and Sandra Morby on £40,000 a year. There's their daughter Ellie with them there. She's 23. Uh, Peter, would you like to press the red button for us and see, there we go, what happens to your uh, livelihood, direct tax, £7.74, better off, that's because of that uh, rate of tax, of course, you're paying a lot less now on basic rate income tax, indirect tax, £2.34, worse off, though, the net effect on you, Peter uh, and Sandra, £5.40 a week, better off, how about that? Well, I feel that uh, it, it isn't fair that I should be better off when, when somebody at that end of the in income uh, range is worse off and, and, and can do nothing about it. Um, most of the things in the budget I do welcome, but um, it just doesn't seem fair that uh, at the bottom end of the uh, scale that they're actually worse off. I don't think there should be any okay. worse off at all. Sandra, how about that? Well, uh, how are you going to be particularly affected personally by this? Uh, well, I'm going to be better off in time. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I think you drink the odd little bit of whiskey, don't you? Yes, I do, yes. Well, that's not bad, is it? It's no, down I'm, in price. Yes, I think it was quite a good budget, really, and I'm glad he's doing something about pollution. That OK, let, let's, yeah. let, let's go on and see what our, our best of family in the, the BBC's budget time think about all this. Now, here they are outside their uh, rather smart-looking bachelor. It looks really like your house, uh, Stan and Helen. But here we have you on £100,000 a year. Stan, would you like to press the button? That's the stuff. And here we go. Direct tax, then your £7.74, the same as uh, Peter, was £7.74. Better off. Indirect tax means you're £5.13. Worse off, you drive a couple of cars, don't you? So the effect on you is that you're better off by £2.61. You've actually done a lot well out of this budget. Is that fair? Uh, that, that's reasonably fair, yes. I agree with Peter who spoke previously. It's a bit bad luck for the unemployed. You know, I'd have seen the unemployed, they're worse off. I don't see any logic in that at all. Um, but I've seen some good parts of the budget. I think the budget is good generally for the country. Helen, what would you like him done that he hasn't done? Well, we're very happy with it, aren't we? We, we? It is a wealthy man's budget. But like Peter here, I feel very sorry for the other people at the other end of the scale. And especially the one parent family who they've penalised. A parent that has to take the children to school in a car are already uh, on the breadline 
can't afford the car in the first place can now no longer afford the test disc, the petrol, and okay. All right. Here. So just very before we get back to David, just a yeah. very quick yeah, impression from you as to whether you think this is an election-winning budget. Yeah. You're shaking yeah. your heads. No, nobody. Yes, Even I think it is. Ah, Stan, think you think is. so? But you're making a few bob anyway, aren't you? But yeah, you don't do all that well out of it. <laughs> it's, not the, it's not the few bob. Uh, there's one particular part I like. Very briefly. Like a lot. The, the, the tax on flight. The whiskey reduction. It might encourage people to take the holidays if it goes that way in Cornwall rather than the cost of rather. <laughs> oh, that, and no, that's what I would that. like to see. Not a, not a great budget for all of you then, except for Stan. Anyway, back to you, David, with that, uh, with that impression. Right. Thanks very much, um, Peter. Let's just have a look then, if you've just come in at this budget and what it contained, um, changes such as they were. The basic rate of tax cut by one penny to 23 pence instead of 24 pence. The lower band widened by 200 pounds. So you have 200 pounds more on which you pay 20 pence. Allowances, the personal allowance, let's say before you start paying tax at all, goes up by 280, that's 200 pounds more than indexing it. And the married couple goes up by 40 pounds. So that's uh, indexed as normal. Uh, duties, they fall most heavily on tobacco, on cigarettes, which go up 15 pence, on uh, cigars, on pipe tobacco. No change at all on beer and wine. Those prices remain the same. And spirits goes down by 26 pence a bottle. If you drive a car, uh, your car tax disc will go up by five pounds. And a litre of petrol and diesel, most sorts, goes up by threepence a litre. No particular surprise in either of those. So those are the key changes that were made by a Chancellor who said he was being very cautious and prudent. And uh, the effect on uh, individuals, and let's have a look in a moment at personal finance, one or two other measures. First of all, the inheritance tax threshold goes up to 215,000. It would have gone to 205,000. That's the uh, value of your, uh, what you leave behind when you go, uh, and uh, you'll be taxed on it over 215,000 now. And gradual withdrawal of profit-related pay from 98 it doesn't actually get phased out entirely until the turn of the century, but it's a, an attempt, the Chancellor said, to redress something that had become much too big a burden uh, on other taxpayers who weren't in profit-related pay schemes, and it was only intended as a temporary measure by the Chancellor who introduced it 10 years ago. And no extra benefit to lone parents. This is going to be phased out, single parents, from April 98. Uh, it won't happen immediately, but then they will be on the same footing as married couples. Well, those are uh, one or two of the key personal finance measures. Lorna Burke is with me here. Now, just talking about that last one, um, is that a surprise to you that the two should be evened out? Well, n not really, because the government has been saying that they're going to do something to address the imbalance between single parents and married couples. But it is quite devastating. We do ha don't have the details yet. But loan parent benefit is a means-tested benefit that's paid in, in addition to income supplement. And it's worth £5.20 a week at the moment. Now, if that goes and it's not compensated for by anything else, that's uh, a huge blow to single parents. Similarly, the single parent benefit, which is a non-means-tested benefit, which is paid in addition to child benefit, that's 6 30 a week. And if that goes as well, people are going to be considerably worse off. Now, we don't know the details. Maybe there will be some compensating factors, but that's a huge chunk out of single parent families um, budget and there's a million of them and it's the children who suffer. What else uh, struck you from this, from the point well, of view of the families that we were hearing looking at their rather meagre pickings? Well I don't know how those the... sums were calculated right. because on my assumptions the, the vast majority of people will be neither better nor worse off because what the Chancellor has done, he's given away with one hand in tax cuts and he's more or less raked it all back in extra duty on cigarettes and petrol. For example, if you smoke 20 cigarettes a day you're going to be paying £1.20 a week more. If there's two of you smoking 20 cigarettes a day that's £2.40 and then if you drive your car any distance at all that's going be an extra pound a week so the vast majority of people are absolutely no better and no worse off if you are going to be better or worse off it will be simply because you don't drive a car or don't smoke so and that's you, all. Your, your view is it won't really have much of an impact on, I think on have very people's impact. view of this government and how, how, uh, how well they're doing I think there are on the other hand that most people quite like that I think the education um, improvements and extra spending on education and the health service and that if it means that there's no change I think most people will accept that um, I think, as I said, one sort of um, unpleasant aspect of it is this, this uh, reduction in benefits to single parents which, who really will suffer. Uh, anything else that we should pick up in that? The inheritance tax changes, of course, well, a back very small number well, of people. Well, a maximum of 6,000 people at the margin. I mean, if you're in that band of 200,000 to 
215, the maximum benefit is, is £6,000 to you. And the profit related pay? Uh, that could have quite an effect on those industries which have made maximum use of this because it will put up their labour costs. Have you, have you come across many people who've, who've been rushing into these schemes in the last year um, or so? I'm told quite a lot of retailers do it, and it would have an effect on, on the large chains, um, grocery stores, I think. Okay, and what about the, the Banana Republic tax, as I always think of it, the one on flying in an aeroplane? Goes up double to go within the United Kingdom, double to go abroad. Well, in real terms, airfares are so cheap now by comparison with 10 years ago that um, I can see that it's the logic in doing it, and I don't think it's going to deter people from going anywhere if they really want to go. What about insurance? Again, the margins on insurance are so huge in most sectors of the insurance industry. I mean, the, the scope for cost-cutting, because they're vastly overstaffed and everything else, is so enormous that if the insurance industry really wants to absorb that, it can. And so I think their complaints are just the sort of you know, more or less um, expected squeals when they But if you're saying they're fat cats, once a fat cat, always a fat cat, and no, they'll no, pass it on to the so. customer, wouldn't they? I don't think so, no, because the competition now in the insurance industry is so fierce that you can't pass on any costs at all. Indeed, you're having to reduce them. So I would think most of the sensible insurers will simply absorb that and they won't put up their premiums. So insurance company profits predicted to fall? By um, back possibly, this afternoon. possibly, yes? but that's the, that's the inefficient ones, and there's plenty of scope for improvement on efficiency. Okay, thanks so much. Let's go back now to the House of Commons, where Tony Blair, the leader of the opposition, wound up his speech denouncing the Chancellor's spending plans as a Tory confidence trick, and said the budget did nothing to tackle Britain's fundamental problems involving investment, education, and unemployment. Since this Prime Minister came to power, the number of jobs in the economy has actually fallen. Last year, let me say, last year, which was supposed to be the year that they boast most about, the number of full-time male jobs actually fell. So nothing in this budget tackles those fundamental problems. When we're cutting training, when we're doing nothing but a few make-work schemes for long-term unemployed, when infrastructure spending is cut, when there's no help for investment, then I say, without the measures for the long term to increase investment, boost education, tackle that structural unemployment, we will never have a recovery or prosperity that lasts. That is why we say the Conservatives have failed. And when he mentions welfare dependency as he did, this is the government that has doubled welfare dependency in this country. And that, of course, is their failure. They spend money, the welfare bills are up, investment is down, they have had the colossal bonus of North Sea oil and asset sales, £200 billion and squandered it. The tax burden is up, of course, except for the very most wealthy. And why? Why? Because they have always thought that if you looked after a few at the top, the many would prosper. That it didn't matter how divided, fractured or unequal our society became. They thought if they satisfied the short term, the long term would look after itself. But it doesn't work like that. And undereducated people will never make a prosperous country. A society marked with gross inequality simply spends money cleaning up the consequences of it. If we do not invest now, we will never reap the reward for the future. And a nation run for the few will never be fit for the many. Those are the fundamental questions that this budget does not answer. It's not just that he's wrong on a lot of the figures he gave. It's not just that he's concealed a lot of the true facts. It's that when those fundamental questions are met and have to be answered, that party opposite has no vision for the future that can possibly answer them. Mr Deputy Speaker, this is actually the last gasp budget of a government whose time is up which can't be trusted with the future and can't make amends for the past. We've heard all their promises before. We heard them at the last election and did not believe them. The difference this time is that the country doesn't now believe them either. They can't be trusted on tax. They can't be trusted on the economy. They can't be trusted on the health service. They can't be trusted on education. They can't be trusted with our future. The truth is, 17, 18 years of one government, there are no excuses left. There is nothing left for them to do except go, and the sooner the better.
Tony Blair in the House of Commons just now. And now we go down to the House and join John Sopel, who has some important backbenchers with him. John. Well, MPs are meeting all over the place in little gaggles to chew over what the budget meant. I'm joined by three distinguished parliamentarians, all of whom at the last election stood on the Conservative platform, but now have dispersed somewhat. Uh, John Redwood, still a Conservative, former Tory leadership challenger, Alan Howarth, the Labour MP for Stratford and Avon, and Emma Nicholson of the Liberal Democrats, also once a Tory. Uh, John Redwood, let me come to you first. Was this an election winning budget? It's a very prudent budget. It's a budget designed to remove the pressure for higher interest rates. So I think it is a budget which people will see uh, is sensible to try and make sure the recovery continues. You didn't say yes to that question about is it an election winning budget? Well, of course I want it to be an election winning budget, but I'm telling you what sort of a budget it is. It's not an election winning budget in the sense that it doesn't give away an awful lot of money we can't afford to give away, and that would have been wrong. So I think the Chancellor made the right judgment to make sure he was concentrating on running the economy well. How difficult is it to go into an election with the burden of taxation higher than when you went into the last election, having said then that you were going to cut taxes? Well, the issue in the next election will be which is the lower tax party. We now have two budgets uh, where we've been lowering income taxes, and as the Chancellor made clear today, the uh, average family is going to be a lot better off at the time of the next election than they were at the time of the last election. We also know that Labour and Liberal want to put taxes up. The Liberal wants to raise income taxes, and Labour have a lot of new taxes in mind with their windfall profits tax, a tax on energy, uh, and taxes on London, the tartan tax, a training tax, you, and all the you, rest you, of it. You said it was a prudent and cautious budget. Some might say it was a budget not preparing for the next election, but preparing for monetary union. Well, it, the Chancellor made clear that it will get us into shape on the budget deficit requirement of the Maastricht Treaty. But I think he also has a domestic reason for doing it. He obviously is worried that if he doesn't cut public borrowing by enough, interest rates would have to go up again. Uh, he's trying to avoid that, and rightly so, because that wouldn't be a good backdrop for an election. Alan Howarth, let me come to you now. Do you welcome the cut in ta income tax? It seems to me a budget that is imprudent. I'm always very doubtful about a Chancellor who says that consumer spending is going to be the engine of growth next year. I also think it's incredible. We had promises last year on health and on education. We only saw one out of 12 of those hospitals that were promised to be funded by the PFI, and that contract was actually just signed last night. On education, we saw completely illusory increases in spending promised last year, and it's exactly the same trick this year. So presumably, if imprudent, then you'll vote against the tax cut? It's also, it's also a very unfair budget, and that is, that is something else that we need to get into focus. The attacks on the unemployed, a young couple unemployed, and there are one in five households that are out of work now in this country with nobody in work. They're going to be worse off. But, the but attack on lone parents is, I'm afraid, very disagreeable politics. But, but about the tax cut, would you vote against it? Uh, that, that's a judgment that the Labour Party will have to reflect upon and make uh, during the course of the budget What's debate. your view on what it should be? Well, my view, on the, my, my personal view on, on that is that since we've seen these vast increases in taxation under the Tories, 22 tax increases since the last election, and since we, since we are seeing an average family paying more than £2,000 in tax over that period, still even after Ken Clark's measures today, then I don't think that uh, the Labour Party need necessarily feel it's got to vote against the, the very small tax reductions that he's introduced today. Emma Nicholson. The tax cut is a sop to Cerberus, and indeed, I'm sorry he didn't heed both uh, Edward Heath, who urged him to withstand pressure to reduce direct taxation last month, and he didn't, with, uh, he didn't uh, uh, heed Douglas Hurd, who didn't believe that a budget, uh, that an election would be won by reducing income tax against a background of sacked teachers or closed hospital wards. He didn't even believe himself when he said, Kenneth Clark, the public will be deeply suspicious of any tax cuts. But he said that last month. But hasn't your erstwhile friend actually presume, pro uh, produced a minor miracle with the economy? <laughs> I fear it isn't a minor miracle. In his own little red book, we can see that non-North Sea oil productivity is continuing to fall, and it's lower today than it was in 1978. And in fact, although he kept on talking uh, that, uh, about our uh, fast-growing economy and the best in Europe and all the rest of it, in fact, our world market share, which is the only thing that really counts, is less than half that of France and is lower than it's been in our entire history. That's the background against which we have this rather sad budget. It's a last dying kick of a dead government. Very this budget but... increases spending on health and education, so Emma Nicholson is quite wrong to say there are going to be sacked teachers, there are going to be more policemen, more money in the schools, more money in the hospitals, I'm sure we're all welcome. Okay. No, 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 this argument... No, 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 this no, argument this, no, 47 no, people I'm in sorry, primary school I'm sorry, in my school, 47 the children there in are spending on, on education, there you not are. the actuality of spending. Already uh, local education authorities are paying well, uh, paying well, uh, well uh, above their... their well, it's Labour who are in control of these authorities. One at a time, we'll be voting against the income tax cut, and John is not being correct. 
exactly what he says. Labour are quite right to be spending up to the limit that they're permitted to spend, and I wish they were permitted to spend more on education. Education is the investment that we absolutely have to make as a society. We would have voted if we for it had the tax cut been in favour of education. There you are. There we must leave it. A flavour of the arguments that will be raging in Westminster throughout the evening. David. Thank you, John. Well, I'm joined by Gordon Brown, the Shadow Chancellor of the Exchequer. The Chancellor said that he was neither Scrooge nor Santa Claus. Uh, what would you have done different? I think it's a very disappointing budget because it does nothing really to prepare this country for the future. There's nothing about the problems we have in investment. There's very little on education. He's actually cutting the training budget. It is not a budget uh, for fairness. It's not really a budget that you can say points the way uh, to what a future society should look like or a future economy. And it doesn't even make amends for the mistakes and the broken promises of the past. So you'd have liked to have seen him give better allowances for investment rather than cut them out? Well, instance, I think he should have been looking at that. And he certainly should have been looking at education and training in a way that is uh, vital for the future development of our economy. But as far as his immediate changes on taxation, uh, we've had 22 tax rises and we've got more today. Uh, he's raised uh, a council tax clearly by the decisions he's made on local government uh, finance. He's raised airport tax. Uh, a family of four could be paying about £80 for a holiday in America. He's raised insurance uh, tax. He's abandoned profit-related pay for four million people, mainly low-paid workers. So he's taken a great deal from people uh, before he's given them a very small income tax uh, but, but, cut. But and I think people will judge uh, the budget as one of five in a parliament where people are now paying £2,000 more cumulatively in tax after all the promises that were made by the Conservatives at the last election they would cut tax year on year. But they have broken the promises. But you're not saying you should have cut taxes over all this time round. What you? I'm saying is the Conservatives have been unable because of their economic weakness to redeem ah. the promises they made. Now Mr Major went into the last election saying he wouldn't raise VAT. We now know that over the Parliament he's raised it and he hasn't been able to cut it in this budget. National insurance he's raised hasn't been able to cut it Income as tax he said, he's raised. As he, he hasn't said, been able, if you have, a, if you have a slump, you look different. after people, and that means people have got to pay for it. Yes, but the you know the, that. You, you, have, you, pay, yeah, yeah, you yeah. pay people are out of work, yes, and it costs if, more. Yes, but if Mr. Major's point was accurate, in a recovery, he would try and make amends for his broken promises. Now, he hasn't got an economy that is strong enough to do so, and he goes into the election as someone who's raised taxes 22 times. People are paying cumulatively. I think the right figure is more than £2,100 extra in tax. Now, this was the government that fought the election on being the tax-cutting party. They go into the election as the tax-raising party, never to be trusted again So what, tax. Are you, what are you going to do when this comes up for the vote? Are you going to vote against the one-penny reduction well, in Well, I made it clear this morning that uh, if um, uh, it is a 1p uh, reduction, I take the view that people have suffered enough. We are not going to vote against that, and the Labour Party will not vote against it. And I think you've got to bear in mind that uh, people getting a 1p tax cut are also seeing all these bills rise, and for many people, the tax cut is wiped out even before they start. I mean, after all, petrol and uh, duties are going up uh, almost immediately. The tax cut only comes in April. And I think many, many people will be worried about the withdrawal of profit-related pay uh, tax relief because that will be an additional cost to them that is far greater than any reduction in taxation. So you would have kept that, which he sees as a sort of tax loophole that's being exploited. Well, Labour would, it's, it's Labor not, would it's, restore it's, that. It's not a tax loophole. No, I'm not promising to restore it. I've, I've made uh, it clear that we will only promise what we can deliver. People must be able to trust the government. I'm not going to pluck promises out of the air. But the government must really answer for the fact that they have uh, uh, introduced profit-related pay tax relief. They have now taken it away. Uh, Low-paid workers have benefited from it. They're going to see that loss. And I think uh, people will be very angry indeed that they've been encouraged to go into these schemes and now find that for three and three quarter million people, uh, particularly in low paid uh, service jobs, it's going to be taken away. So you don't think that he's going to get anywhere by saying he's done the prudent, right thing and the economy, well, as he shows in, in the Red Book and all the figures, is steadily growing all well, the time David, and unemployment well, is Well, David, if he'd equipped the economy for the future, he would have a case. But the fact is, manufacturing output has only risen a quarter of a percent this year. Investment is way below projections. Investment is not going to rise in the way that is necessary to sustain the recovery. The balance of payments deficit is, is going to worsen. And as we already know, we are 11th out of 15th for inflation, 11th out of 15th in Europe for interest rates. We're seeing all the signs of the stop-go cycle re-emerge. Uh, and of course, there is nothing in the budget that will guarantee the levels of investment and capacity, therefore, that are necessary to sustain the growth that we need. Uh, at uh, a reasonable level. Okay, okay. Gordon He's Brown. back to stop go politics. That's the problem. Thank you very much indeed. Well, I'm joined by Robin Oakley, the BBC's political editor, listening to that, listening to our um, backbenchers, former Tories um, in the House of Commons. What do you think the, the political trick 
has been and has it been successful? I'm not sure there has been a political trick. I think that was a, a cautiously minimalist budget by a, a chancellor who really uh, felt he had more to lose politically by getting it wrong than he had to gain by getting it right. I think if he'd wanted to, if he'd shared his party's basic belief that tax cutting leads to winning elections, he could have cut taxes more, but he'd have had to do that at the expense of cutting public expenditure more, he wouldn't have been able to do what he has done to please people rather more carefully by extra spending on schools, on health, on law and order. But is, is there a problem, uh, as Gordon Brown was saying, that in a way he's drawing attention to the failure of the economy by the very fact that he can do so little at this stage? Well, it, that is certainly a point that can be made. And I think there are other weaknesses politically in this budget in that the Chancellor is finding the money to make his sums add up, partly by pushing up by what he's done on local government finance, uh, deliberately pushing up council tax by four billion pounds over three years. As Tony Blair was pointing out, that's an attempt to get political blame on the mostly Labour-led councils there are these days. He's also finding money by talking about closing down tax loopholes. And he used to deride Gordon Brown uh, for saying that he would fund the money to fund Labour's promises by doing precisely that. So I think the, the opposition will fasten on those two particular angles in criticising this budget. So what's the overall political effect going to be? I mean, do you think uh, he's going to win round any voters by this? He's going to get good headlines tomorrow for it? I don't think budgets very often do uh, win round voters, uh, as we were discussing earlier, and give governments immediate boosts in the opinion polls. But what the Chancellor had to do, I think, was to restore credibility. The government's reputation for sound economic management nosedived at the time of being forced out of the ERM uh, in September 92. The opinion polls for the Tories have never really recovered since. Ken Clark is a Chancellor who believes that flashy tax cutting won't do as much for the government as being seen to be safe in charge of the nation's finances. And I think this is a budget which contributes much more to that objective than it does to catching public attention uh, in order to win the election with tax cuts. Well, let's see, thanks very much, Robin, whether it has caught public attention and go back to Leeds and join Diana Medill. Diana? Indeed, we've got some families here who are going to tell us exactly what they think. Uh, Mina Patel, the, you're very concerned about the loss of the lone parent benefit. That's right. I'm not very happy with um, the scheme that they brought out that they're going to abolish the lone parent because um, me as a single parent bringing up a three-year-old son on my own, it's, you know, it's really a big kickback in the teeth, so I'm not very happy at that whatsoever. How much is that actually worth well, to you? Well, it's something like £5.20 a week, but whatever it is, it does help. And with it being totally abolished, it's, you know, it's just not... You know, very happy for me to You're also training to be a driving instructor, so driving. obviously the tax on petrol, that affects That's you. also gone up as well, 3p, I believe, and, you know, that's also a kick in the teeth, basically, for me. So it's not gone too good. So whatsoever. nothing good for no, you no, on no, that. What about you, Richard Cramer? Are you happy or not? Yeah, I think so. Um, obviously, uh, tax benefits are very encouraging. Uh, Julie, who's hopefully going back to work soon, will obviously gain some benefits, especially with the increase in the tax threshold. Um, saving of the one penny in the pound I think is encouraging. Uh, problem is is that they'll probably recover it back somewhere down the line. Slight worry about the increase in uh, duty for the um, for the air travel. Yes, because holidays are going to be a bit dearer now, aren't they? Well, I just wonder whether this might be an opportunity for the tour operators to increase prices again. And, and I suppose at the end of the day, it's a fairly balanced budget as far as the individual is concerned. I mean, you, you gain something on the income tax, but I think you end up paying a little bit more with the increase in fuel duty and the increase in excise licence. So Julie, would it be a vote-winning budget for you, do you think? Yes, I suppose it's, uh, yes, I suppose it will, really. You like it? Yes, thank you. Yes. Richard? Yeah, I think, um, I think it's, it's fairly marginal. I mean, whether they actually has it, what direct impact it has is, is difficult to say. There might be a little bit more expenditure in the pocket, but it's fairly marginal, I would say. OK, let's get some more views. What about this table here? Denise McKenna, your low-paid part-time work. Are you happy with what you heard? No. Um, it means I've got to pay 15 pence extra on a packet of cigarettes, which I don't agree with. That was your luxury, was it? Yes. Uh, taking away the lone parent term benefit as well. Not increasing anything, really. What about personal allowances, though? Because those are up a bit. Uh, just a bit, yes, but um, not enough, really, in my mind, to incite, incite people to go back to work. Um, 
for the wages that are paid in Leeds. So not too happy about not that. Happy. Jeanette Parsons, what about the pensioners? Well, a good deal or not? Yes, the pensioners will still be looking, all 11 million of us, for the feel good factor. This budget doesn't give us anything at all. The only bright spot on the horizon is the 1.6 billion for the health service, which may mean that more money goes into the care in the community, and that we will appreciate very much. But obviously, council taxes will go up. Their food bills will go up because, of course, the transport costs will go. So, therefore, we're worried about that. But can I tell you the one bright spot is that the £70 pounds a week pensioners can now say that they have inheritance tax of 250000 a year. They won't have to pay any tax on it. Now, you think about that for a pensioner at £70 pounds a week. Just what do they think about that? It's ludicrous, isn't it? Jeanette, thank you very much indeed. So, not too happy on the family front here in Leeds. David. And 215,000, not 250,000, I'm afraid to say. Let's just have a summary of the budget as it stands now. Uh, this is the measure if you've just come in and missed the budget program, uh, pro budget speech itself. Income tax, cut by a penny to 23 pence on the basic rate. The 20 pence band is widened by 200 pounds. The allowances, your personal allowance goes up by 280 pounds, 200 pounds odd over the um, inflation proofing of it. So that's £200 extra on which you don't have to pay tax at the 20% or at the other rates. And the married couple's allowance is indexed and goes up by £40. Duties, cigarettes, tobacco, pipe tobacco took the brunt of the increases in duties. 15 pence a pack of cigarettes. Beer and wine, there was no change. Spirits go down 26 pence a bottle on their way down towards continental prices, the Chancellor said. And on motoring... Straightforward indexation, car tax goes up by five pounds and threepence a litre on most petrol and diesels. So those are the main measures announced in this uh, budget. Let's go down and rejoin John Sopel in the House of Commons. And I'm joined now by two representatives from the Nationalist Party's Alex Salmond, the leader of the SNP in Scotland, and Joanne Wynne-Jones from Plycrimi, their budget spokesman. Um, Alex Salmond, let me come to you first. Do you welcome the tax cuts, first of all, that were announced in the budget? Well, I think if there were going to be tax cuts, it should have been on VAT and fuel, and I'd have been much happier to see more concentration on low earners. It should have taken the low rate of tax down. But this is another Tory sleight of hand budget. I mean, the Scottish office budget is going to decline 6% over the next three years, and that means council tax rises and huge cuts in people's services, not for local councils, but the people's services are going to be affected. And I think people have rumbled the Tories, and this sleight of hand is not going to save them in six months' time. But won't the people in Scotland want to have that extra penny off income? tax? Well, I think what Scotland would want is help. If there's help going to be given, let it be concentrated in the low paid. And your pensioner leads summed it up with the Tory attitude. £215,000 disregard on inheritance tax, while old age pensioners have to sell their homes to get into residential care. Now that disparity, that unfairness, is going to be the Tories' undoing, and both in Leeds and in Scotland, the people know it. Just very briefly, what about the increase in petrol tax that, 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 that you know, make the polluter pay was essentially the argument that the Chancellor used? Yes, but it's very savage for rural communities. 90% of the goods in every shop in Scotland come by road. There's now, petrol's now well over £3 a gallon. That's a huge impost. And for the fifth largest oil and gas producer in the world, having uh, bankrolled the Tories over the last 17 years in terms of oil revenues, it's a bit much stuff to pay through the nose for every good in every shop, the length and bread for Scotland. Yeah, Wynne Jones, uh, a prudent and cautious budget, the Chancellor called it. Is that the way you see it? No, certainly not. I think uh, I agree with Alex entirely that he should have done a lot more to assist the, the low paid. He increased personal allowances by just over £200. We would have wanted to double that because obviously if you want incentives to have people to go back to work, the, the, the best you do for, for the low paid is to take them out of the tax bracket altogether or to reduce their marginal rates. Um, that clearly could have been done, but obviously he went for the headline grabbing 1p off, off income tax and that's obviously with two eyes firmly fixed in the next election. Thank you very much, and let's go back to the studio and David. Thanks very much, uh, John. Let's just have a look at the spending changes then that the Chancellor said he was pleased to be making, as well as cutting taxes. He was going to increase spending a bit on key areas, and these are the figures that were announced. A word of caution, uh, Andrew Dillnott of the IFS will interpret these in a moment because they're not quite what they seem necessarily. NHS patient care goes up by 1.6 billion next year. Spending on schools increased by 830 million pounds. Police and prisons up by 450 million, and the total planned spending overall by the government down 7 billion over next, the next three years. Now, Andrew, I'll start with the last one. What does that actually mean? Down, two, down by 7 billion 
three years from now or declining over the it three years? It means a declining total over the three years, so total spending will have been cut. So where is he saving pounds. the money if he's spending it on health and the police and education, or is he not spending it there? Well, he's not the spending it in sharing. quite the same way that he's suggesting. So he said that there will be an extra 1.6 billion on NHS patient care, but in fact, health spending, total spending on the health service, is only going up by 970 million pounds between this year and next year. So a lot but of that is going. Is this an increase on what was planned? Well, there is an increase on what was planned, but it's only an increase of 770 million pounds. I think the reality is the Chief Secretary did run a very, very tight public spending round. Look at education, where there's a, a statement there will be an extra 800 odd million pounds for schools. The reality is, as the Chancellor said in his speech, he has to rely on local authorities delivering that money to schools, although the amount of money they'll have for everything else they provide will be cut. So overall, this is a very tight public spending settlement. And looking to the future, at the moment, the plans in the Red Book are for the level of spending on health to fall in real terms between next year and the year after, which seems inconsistent with the government's pledge. Well, I'm uh, joined by, and listening to that, William Walgrave, Chief Secretary of the Treasury, who was responsible for this spending round, which the Chancellor described as very tough. Um, he used a more ribald expression about it. And uh, Malcolm Bruce, the Liberal Democrats' Treasury spokesman. Uh, Mr. Walgrave, first of all, what do you say to this, that actually it's a slight sleight of hand about increasing spending? It, you haven't actually been able to do very much at this stage. Well, we have increased spending, as Andrew said, on health, and there is an increase in permitted spending power for education. But he is quite right to say that it has been a very tight spending round. The principal purpose of the budget, when you've got an economy growing without inflation, with a good balance of trade and in a, the position which we all want to be in and stay in, is fundamentally to keep the economy on the same track. So this was not a budget where we wanted to take any risks, either on the spending and inflation side or on anything else. Uh, we've got a pretty well neutral tax package. It's an overall fiscal tightening um, because uh, it is right, I think, and most serious commentators from outside have been urging that upon us. We shouldn't take any risks with the interest rates. and so. I think this is a, an extremely sensible, prudent, I think was the word somebody used, and a rather courageous budget by Ken Clark. But, uh, but the difficulty with it is that after 17, 18 years going into a general election, the, s the signal that is being sent by this budget is that we can't do very much because actually we're stuck. Things haven't improved as much as we'd like. There isn't room for more spending. We can't make serious tax cuts and as Tony Blair said taxation for people since 79 is up by 2,000 a head. Well the object, object of government surely uh, economically is to um, do its best to secure increasing living standards that means more jobs low inflation um, and real take-home pay increasing for people now this budget when you take the whole likely course of the economy over the next year will secure a safe further increase in real take-home pay for people. We estimate about £370 for next year, which will mean that since the last election, taking account of all the tax and all the inflation and so on, people will be a bit more than £1,000 better off. Now, that seems to me much the most important thing. We have to manage the taxes, we have to manage inflation, we have to manage public spending to go on delivering safe growth, both in jobs and in take-home pay, without causing inflation but to ruin as, as Gordon Brown, who was sitting in that chair a moment mm. ago, said, the problem about this recovery and whether it will go on is that investment is low, manufacturing productivity is low, and that things are not actually the underlying strength of the economy. Well, he has to look for... ...is not as good as you're claiming. He has to look for gloom wherever he can find it, Gordon, and it's a very depressing thing to be an opposition spokesman when things are going rather well. If you look uh, back over the last 15, 16, 17 years, actually, and this is one of the most fundamental changes in the British economy, we have outperformed, in terms of productivity growth, uh, all our competitors. Thank goodness, because that is where, in the long term, uh, prosperity comes from. So Gordon shouldn't be too gloomy. It's his nature, I think, to be gloomy. It's perhaps his job to be gloomy. The, right. the real truth is that things are going rather well, and the job of the government is to keep them going in the same okay. direction. Malcolm Bruce, things are going rather well, and it's the government's job to keep them going, and that's what he's done. Well, there is a recovery, and it is the government's job to ensure that we sustain that recovery. Uh, and to that extent, the Chancellor was boxed in. But his, his budget actually is dependent on uh, forecasts, which I think are questionable, that he can achieve 3.5% growth and 2.5% inflation. He's actually missed his own inflation forecast already, but he didn't say very much about that. Um, and in reality, 
We've calculated that if you take the council tax effect, the average taxpayer will actually be paying £41 more a year in tax overall on this budget because of the taxes that were flowing through, some additional taxes he put on, and the effect of increased council tax. And they won't be getting the spending on education because the local authorities haven't got the money. That is a simple con trick to try and pass the blame onto local authorities, which of course the Conservatives don't run, Labour and Liberal Democrats do. So we've been conned? No, not at all. There is um, a perfectly... Uh, clear uh, increase in the spending power available to local authorities, which will enable Your own budget actually shows will, the well, total we amount being we cut. Must, we must wait. It doesn't. We must wait for John Gummer's um, uh, explanation of the capping regime tomorrow, without which this can't be uh, completely calculated. But I can assure you that there is an increase in spending power available to local authorities. I am not saying that they don't have to be tough on their other spending, but they have been telling us, and parents have been telling us, that education is their first priority. And I think it is therefore fair to ask them to put the uh, principal part of the increase which is available to them into schools. What about the point about council tax, that that actually is going to the increase, rule out the, the The increase in living reduction. standards is calculated after all tax increases. It's broadly neutral in tax terms and we get the fiscal tightening because we've cut spending. Um, and that, I think, is the right thing to do at this stage in the cycle. We, shouldn't, we should be looking at whether families will be better off uh, in 12 months time than now and on all sensible external predictions they will be the only thing that could threaten that would be if we let the interest rates go out of control upwards or if inflation got out of control the point about inflation we haven't broken our own target on inflation we had a, 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 a jump up in October but any statistician could tell you that it was actually I think the fourth or the fifth best October since the war for inflation it just happened that 12 months ago okay. was the best October since inflation. 12th worst in the European inflation. Union I mean I, I, I think I want to see this, this recovery continue, and I agree with William, that's important, and it's not our job to try and derail the difficulties. <coughs> but the reality is that a growth rate of 3.5% and an inflation target of 2.5% have not yet been delivered by this government. And if it's not delivered, then all the other forecasts on which the Chancellor's uh, optimism is based will fall as okay. well. Br Bridget Rosa, <coughs> one, of the ch one of the Chancellor's advisors on these things, do you think it, he's going to be able to deliver the steady growth in the economy he's talking about? I think that there will be reasonably good growth next year, yes, that consumers are doing better and uh, that has not been derailed by anything that the Chancellor has done in this budget. I think also that inflation in 97 is pretty safe, it's 98 and 99 that I'm more worried about because these things take some time to come through. In terms of the overall budget situation, I mean, really, we're arguing about so little here. I mean, I think mm. that's really fundamentally what we're talking about. Yes, it's prudent. Yes, it's cautious. Whether it's tightening or not, I think we we'll probably won't know for another two or three yeah, years when we finally get some numbers. You're never talking about little when you're five months away at the most from a general election. Every tiny well, little I, bit yes, is Well, yes, but I'm not five months away. I'm just an ordinary no, Commonwealth Garden <laughs> economist. I'm not a politician, <laughs> right, so I can be... Uh, I'm, uh, <laughs> I can look five years ahead and... Uh, and stick to it. Andrew Dillnock, uh, the Chief Secretary was saying that people would be better off. Malcolm Bruce was saying they wouldn't because of the council tax. What's your view about this? Well, I think people will be better off. I think what the government shouldn't really claim is that very much of that is to do with the budget. Uh, the reality in the budget is oh, yeah. there are some taxes going up, some taxes going down. People's incomes overall will rise, but that is because their real incomes, their earnings, are now growing a bit more quickly than inflation. It's not to do with the budget. If the government's to claim any credit, it must be for their overall management of the economy. And we should remember that economies do cycle, and it would be a shame if people's incomes weren't rising four and a half years after the economy started to grow. So uh, are I'm, we, are I'm we not arguing with Andrew on that point at all. I, I'm, I don't think the government should be judged on this one budget. I think the government should be judged on... Pr the fact that we've now had five years of low inflationary growth with unemployment falling well and we want to keep that going. Are we saying that uh, no Chancellor would have done much different in these particular circumstances, uh, Labour, Liberal Democrat or Tory? I don't think many Chancellors would have come up with anything very different on the overall numbers. Uh, clearly different Chancellors would have come up with something different on some of the detail. Uh, I remain concerned about the investment side of things, for example. Uh, the PFI has been not very successful and if you look at public sector investment it's still pretty low okay well thank you all very much indeed and uh, after a budget which the main change is the leaked and uh, well reported one penny off the basic rate from 24 to 23 pence um, not a leak that uh, got into the papers in quite the detail that Hugh Dalton's did in 1947 but nevertheless may have embarrassed the Chancellor from all of us here with a reminder you can see CFAX page 124 if you want an index of the budget changes good afternoon <laughs>